can't have. Now listen, you the right of the Stop calling here. me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names. Stop you and in let's your get goddamn face, and let's you'll stay plastered. <laughs> Would you call God material or immaterial? Immaterial. What is something that's immaterial? Something not extended in space. Can you give me an example of anything other than God that's immaterial? Lost logic. This educational system is going to fail you. Well, I graduated from college believing exactly as you believe. Yep. All right. Episode 34 of the 40 Ounce Hemlock Podcast, and here we go. Drop the beat. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is part 14 of Unmasking Antifa. Welcome back. Um, So excited to see the downloads on this series, and of course the past series, which the downloads keep coming in for the past series too, but so excited to see people following the series and the feedback that we've gotten. Um... We're just going to get right started. we got a lot to say, a lot to do, and like I've been saying now for a couple episodes, this is the second to the last episode. So we got to get where we got to get in this episode so we can do what we got to do in the last episode. And of course, you know what we got to do in the last episode. It's the name of the whole series, Unmasking Antifa, all right? And it's going to be a long one. Look, it's just going to be a long one. I, I apologize, but I don't. It's going to be really interesting, but it's going to be a long one because it's the second to the last one. So do whatever you got to do. I'm going to try to take some breaks at the you know 30 and 60 minute mark, stuff like that, You know, on the half hour, on the hour. If you need to step away, pause it, come back to it another time, by all means do so. Whatever works, all right? But we're just going to plow through. Uh, so here we go. We've heard, going way back to that, that Heidegger quote, we've heard predecessors of Marx in the general tradition of what we've called radicalist thinking. Radicalist thinking that all shares this one common trait where it places individual persons as secondary to the collective, right? You know, in our society, in our time, in our culture, in our media, in the national dialogue, we you often hear people talking about communism as, as if it's far leftism and, and Nazism as if it's of the far right. This is a complete mistake. It's a complete mistake. It's completely superficial. It fails to understand what both of them have in common and why both of them are essentially leftism. And only on the most superficial and unimportant and non-consequential analysis is one of the left and the other is of the right. But to call Nazism or fascism or whatever a far right movement is very useful to what the media is trying to do to us in our country so they continue to do it. But if you've listened to the past couple episodes, listened to the series, you understand why they are all of the same ilk. And that is because the fundamental political philosophical question that you can ask, the first thing you got to know in understanding what a political social theory is and what are its consequences and what's important about it and what it comes from and what it leads to, the fundamental question is where does it place the importance of the individual, the concerns of the individual, the rights of the individual, the definition, the meaning of the individual, where does it place those? I'm talking about the individual person. Where does it place those in relation to the rights, the meaning, the importance, the significance, etc., of the group? Once you say that the group is fundamental and that the individual only gets its meaning, its significance, or his meaning, or her significance, right? Only gets its meaning, its significance, its rights, everything, right? From the group. That is, once you place the group first and try to work out, in light of the primacy of the group, what is proper to the individual, once you do that, you're a leftist. And fascism and communism and Nazism all have this one fundamental thing in common. They answer this first fundamental question of political philosophy in all the same way. And that is why they're leftist. What they disagree about is utterly superficial. It's utterly, it doesn't matter. Okay. Remember, we saw that the Communist Party was instructed formally from the top down to vote for Hitler, a Nazi. Remember that? So we we heard Heidegger, you know, and others express this this wish for this painful death of Western society by the reduction of society to chaos and confusion. You know, and I'm not going to go back to the Heidegger quote again, but you remember all the colorful language or the morbidly colorful language he wanted to see Western culture 
again, your culture, your world, you. He wanted to see it suffocate and collapse in madness and confusion. Likewise, we've heard Marx and many followers, and many more could be enumerated. We've heard Marx endorse terrorism as a means of bringing about that same sort of destruction of Western society so that a new communist society can be built in its place. All right. And we've heard more recently the Frankfurt School, this group of German, you know, academic Marxists who came over just at the onset of World War II, came over to the United States. We've heard these guys concoct this critical theory, this quote unquote, quote end quote, intellectualized version of Marx's basic idea. And, and, and what I mean by intellectualized version, version is that it's dressed up in fancy academic names like culture studies and critical race theory and social justice studies and deconstructionism and post-structuralism and post-colonialism and feminist epistemology. And I didn't mention that one last time, but I mean, you could just go, you could just go on and on and on. And as I speak, new ones are being invented. All right. So we're not going to catch up with these folks, but we don't have to catch up with them because we're going to find out how they got off the finish line in the first place. And then we're going to realize we don't need to race with them. We just need to understand what kind of game they're running. Okay. It's a racket, as you'll see. I think a couple episodes back, I read you a quote from Roger Kimball, and we're going to hear from him more tonight, but Roger Kimball said, structuralism was not an important intellectual development, neither was deconstruction, or post-colonialism, or new historicism, or all the other academic fads you know, that we've talked about. He says, one and all, they were, they continue to be, intellectual con games, utterly devoid of merit, except as tools of obfuscation and intellectual corruption. I want you to keep that word obfuscation in mind, or the meaning of that word in mind, okay? Just hang on. So we've heard all these variations on Marx's basic idea advanced by these folks. In, in, in the guise of all these theories. And by doing so, we've seen that what they hope to bring about has been what you might call cultural Marxism, you know, where society's broken up into competing interest groups, minorities, and so forth, all these different groups. And those groups are then set to war against one another. As they're each told that they're all victims, you know, and being oppressed by another group, and then you know you got to fight back. So now that, then it's, it's just it's just all out war. But there's more to say about specifically the language, the expression, like literally the language, the words with which you hear Marx and all these folks who follow him describe the desired demise of America. Again, I just want to reemphasize this point: your demise of Western culture, of America. You keep hearing phrases, like we said a moment ago, like chaos and confusion, you know, suffocation and madness, right? We heard Marx talk about the bloody birth pangs of the revolution, right? And given that, as we just saw in the last episode, this new breed of Marxists, this ac academic Marxist, this intellectualized Marxist, despite having some new tactics, you know, like we saw Marcuse invent this idea of tolerance, invent this idea of political correctness, invent this idea of multiculturalism, all to advance Marxism, right? Despite the fact that there's some new tools in the tool belt, they don't discount. In fact, they all but endorse. In fact, I would argue if you if you go back to that essay, that book on tolerance that Marcuse wrote that we touched on last episode, it is endorsed. They all but endorse or do endorse violence. Violence, terrorism, as Marx said, as a means to bringing about what they're trying to bring about, which is the collapse of this society. So I want to talk to you about chaos and confusion. I want to connect some dots. But before I do, I'm going to say something that's going to seem like it's utterly unrelated. I want to just read you something quick from Wikipedia. It has nothing to do on, this, on the surface with what we're talking about here. But I'm doing this here at the top so that you see, when it does come up, what, 
what the line is between the several dots and how and what picture they form. So I'm going to read you something. Now, normally I would give Wikipedia a really short shrift. Okay, I have no no illusions about the the biases and the the propaganda at work in a lot of Wikipedia articles. However, this is fairly innocuous, so I'm going to trust it, and it's going to get the basic point across, and we're not going to be you know we're not going to worry about it. So this from Wikipedia. Now this is called. I just picked Wikipedia. I could have picked any article that summarized this thing. This is called the so-called affair. It's also been known as the so-called hoax. Bear with me. Two paragraphs. I just want you to think. I just want you to hear this, and then we'll move on. But by the end of the episode, we'll come back to this, and you'll see why I'm talking about it at the top. The so-called hoax was a scholarly publishing sting per- perpetrated by Alan Sokol, who was a physics professor at the University of at New York University and the University College London. In 1996, Sokol submitted an article to a journal called, are you ready for this? I got to stop and say something about this. A journal called Social Text. Now, let's go back to our episode where we enumerated these many theories that Marxism is dressed up in these days. And we talked about deconstructionism. What, what did deconstructionism have to say, right? There is no fact of the matter. Everything is interpretation, Right? When we interpret a text, we're actually not only just interpreting another layer of text beneath it, we're also adding a text to it. We're, we're, we can never get to the core fact. There is no such thing as meaning. Meaning can never truly be discerned, okay? Because the very act of interpretation of a text, or anything, but in, 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 in Jacques Derrida's case with, with deconstructionism, the very act of interpreting a text imposes the values of the interpreter on the text and gives it new meaning. So you can never get to the core of the onion, the meaning as you peel away the layers. You'll never do it. It doesn't exist. Meaning doesn't exist. In other words, meaning, and everything depend- that depends on meaning, which is everything, is a social construction. See? Okay, if you haven't listened to past episodes, stop now, okay, and go back so you can come along with us. This journal is called Social Text. Now, it's an academic journal, says Wikipedia, of postmodern culture studies. Well, of course, that should be obvious by what I just broke away and said. The submission from SoCal was an experiment to test the journal's intellectual rigor and specifically to investigate whether, quote, a leading North American journal of culture studies whose editorial collective includes such luminaries as Frederick Jameson he may be a communist. and Andrew Ross he may be a communist. would publish an article liberally salted with nonsense if A, it sounded good, and B, it flattered the editor's ideological preconceptions. Now, do I need to talk about how important that phrase, ideological preconceptions, preconceptions is to what we've been saying since part one of this series? I hope not. All right. That gentleman on stage who's saying all the best basketball players are from Norway has an ideological preconception that he will not let go of, that is not adjustable by, amenable to, affected by the evidence. And that is why you cannot get him to see, or he won't see, or some weird admixture between those two that... What he's saying is not a theory at all. It's not science at all. It's not, it's nothing. It's a tautology. It's just a statement about his definitions, okay? Those are his ideological preconceptions at work. Anyways, going on. The article was called (laughs) Transgressing the Boundaries Towards a Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Gravity. Now, if I read that and you're like, huh, you're right. I don't, you're not really going to see why you're right until the end of this episode or as we get towards the end of this episode. The article was published in the Social Text Spring-Summer 1996 edition, which was called Science Wars. It proposed that quantum gravity, don't worry, you don't have to know what quantum gravity is, just listen. This is a serious physics professor from a major university who's publishing in a culture studies journal. Why? Why is he doing that? Listen, the article proposed that quantum gravity is a social and linguistic construct. At that time, the journal did not practice academic peer review, yeah, and did not submit the article for outside expert review by a physicist. You would think that's exactly the whole point of an academic journal, you know, peer review and, you know, the building of the foundation of the structure of knowledge. Well, there is no foundation to knowledge if you believe that everything is conventional and everything is a social construct, right? Um, On the day of its publication... 
in May 1996, Sokol revealed in Lingua Franca that the article was a hoax. Now, the hoax sparked a debate about the scholarly merit of commentary about the physical sciences by those in the humanities. Yeah, what else did it spark a debate about? It sparked a debate about the influence of postmodern philosophy on social disciplines in general. Yeah, what else did it start a debate about? It started a debate about academic ethics. Yeah, including whether Sokol was wrong to deceive the editors and readers of social text, and whether social text had exercised appropriate intellectual rigor. Okay? Let's focus on that phrase, intellectual rigor, because in this context, they're talking about the intellectual rigor involved in actually investigating a paper that's submitted to the journal and reviewing it, you know, and, and discerning its scholarly merit. But it's an, it's an interesting phrase because intellectual rigor or the, the pretense of intellectual rigor is somehow very important to this Marxist project. And that's what we're looking at in this episode, okay? So let's get back to it. Now, man, picture's worth a thousand words. I'm sitting here staring at a picture of a guy in a little green commie hat, right? Um, with, his, with a little gas mask on and sunglasses. They're always covered up. They always don't want you to know who they are. Well, a picture's worth a thousand words, and this picture is, I guess, worth a thousand and ten, or it's worth a million, I don't know, because in this case, the guy's holding up a sign. He's holding up a sign, and what does the sign say? It says, America was never great. We need to overthrow this system. Hmm. Sounds like Jack, doesn't it? Sounds like these professors we've been talking about, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, he doesn't have a hoodie on, mind you, but I'm sure it's tied around his waist, and he'll, he'll put it on later if it gets cold. Um... You know, now, God forbid that, the, the, I don't want to reuse, I know the word useful idiot is so commonly thrown around. I'm, I almost hesitate to use it for that reason, but God forbid that this kid gets his way. And by his way, I mean what he's claiming he wants is displayed on this sign he's holding up. You know, he'll discover far too late um, that what he wanted to tear down and participated in tearing down and advocated for the tearing down of was not what he took it to be. And his vague idea about what should replace it that he harbors in his head very loosely, it's very vague, if it were realized, if it were to come to be, would be a monstrous evil. And, more importantly to his immediate personal interests, it would have no loyalty once erected to those who helped erect it. It's an important point. You know, the, the, the intellectual classes in these, in these revolutions, in these totalitarian societies, very intellectual folks who help get this thing off the ground, and they're often done away with right after the thing has gotten off the ground. I mean, look at Stalin, you know, all the, all the folks that Stalin turned around and killed right after he was done using them. So here's going to be the thesis. I want to say something at the top that is essentially everything we're trying to say here, and then I'm just going to spend the rest of the episode filling it out. The chaos and the confusion that you see in the streets you know, at the social, at the material level, on the, on the ground, as they say. It doesn't occur in a void, all right? Now, true enough, its perpetrators do believe that the material world itself exists in a void, as we saw Jack to come to believe after he dropped his religious belief, you know. Um, and surely all of them are expressing the desire that they, they, they long to see it return to a void, right? All right? Um, and, and none of those facts are unrelated. But it doesn't exist in a void. Now, it's possible that all throughout, as we've been leading up to this, that when I've been saying that we're going to talk about chaos and confusion, um, you know, that we keep hearing Marx and his followers and others allude to, you might have thought that what I was referring to was, you know, well, what did I put in the pictures on that? Fires in the street and, you know, riots and kids with black hoodies and bats and, chaos, you know, that. Um, that's not what I mean by chaos and confusion, at least fundamentally. I've called the series Unmasking Antifa. And if all we were going to do was talk about you know, what these losers in masks were doing, then that really wouldn't be an appropriate title, right? I mean, we want to see what is behind the obvious, behind the facade, behind the mask. And to do that, we're going to have to see what's inside the head. And to do that, we're going to have to see what's inside the mind. And that's what we've been working on. And that's what we're going to do with this final piece today.
And then in our last episode, you know, truth be told, we're going to see what's behind the mind, so to speak. But if that's not immediately obvious what I mean here, don't, don't worry about it. We'll get there. In that vein, what we're going to be talking about is a different kind of chaos and confusion. But don't get it twisted. They are not unrelated. In fact, it is the essential thesis here that they are integrally, fundamentally, necessarily related. Okay? We're going to talk about intellectual mental, psychological, ideological chaos and confusion as a cause of the chaos and confusion that you see on the news in the streets with the violence. All right? Intellectual chaos and confusion. In other words, chaos and confusion at the level of ideas. Now, when we think about Antifa or Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street or you know MoveOn.org or the social justice wars, or any of these folks running around campuses with baseball bats, essentially, or black hoodies or whatever. Of course, we're thinking about the more explicit form of chaos, of violence, terrorism. But if we just look at that, we're not going to have the full story, the full picture. And I hope it's clear by now that if there's anything we're trying to do with this podcast, it's get the big picture that I just don't think we're getting many other places. And I'm trying to offer you at least a piece of it that you're not going to get anywhere else. So what I want you to understand is that the chaos begins with the chaos in the mind, all right? It begins with the chaos in the mind. So there's the thesis. In fact, we got the break coming up here, but let me just let me just color this for you. Let me just drive the point home. I mean, you you have the the essence of the show here in the in, at the top. Let me just drive the point home. That professor in California who was arrested when it was found out that he had beaten multiple people in the streets with a U-lock bike lock during Antifa protests, that community college professor, professor of ethics, who was caught on tape beating a Trump supporter over the head with a U-lock. Man, if you, if you don't know what a U-lock is, you need to go to your local bike shop and pick one up and swing it around in your hand a little bit. And then imagine being cracked in the side or over the top of the head with it. All right? In the street. Chaos in the streets. I'm arguing here that it begins with a chaos in the mind. And this hooligan, this devil, this little community college Marx with his little with his little his little Marxist beard, who imagines himself a revolutionary, has disowned his family because they don't see, you know, the, the true realities of the revolution. He perfectly illustrates the point. What did he say in the Rolling Stone interview with him? And why Rolling Stone would interview this, you know, whatever. What did he say? They said, are you worried that the kind of violence that you're participating in un- takes away from your cause? Because it, it, you, by doing it, you lose the moral high ground. What did he say? He said, no. And why did he say it? He said, the moral high ground is just a construction of the narrative class. Now, let's transpose this into the terms that we're more familiar with over the last few episodes. What does he mean? He just means morality is a construct. The narrative class is Marx's bourgeoisie. It's those who putatively, supposedly, according to this theory, control society. So morality, he's saying, is a construct. It's something, like Thrasymachus said 2,000 years earlier, that has just been invented to oppress me. So I I don't need to worry about being immoral when I fight back against it. This is a professor of ethics. In, In other words, a professor of morality. You see, the chaos in the streets is preceded by, is caused by a chaos, an intellectual chaos in the mind. Incidentally, this guy's okay, Cupid or whatever that dating site is, his, his online dating profile, in addition to a, listing a whole bunch of non-gender conforming nonsense, said that what he was working to precipitate in the world was what? The destruction of of Western society. Okay? It's teaching your kids at the local community college and then finishing class, putting on his little black jacket, you know, and running out into the street and beating, was it seven or eight people over the head with a heavy, blunt steel object because they dared stand in the streets saying, I guess in this context, that they supported Donald Trump. Okay? So I hope you see the relevance of what we're talking about here. 
incidentally. You know that you know that community college that he taught at was called El Diablo. <laughs> but more on more on that later. All right, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break, um, and we're when we come back. We're going to expand on this point. We have a lot more to say about it. I just wanted to get the thesis out in the first part of the show. I just wanted to get the main point out. There's going to be a lot to say here. So take a quick musical break, and we'll come right back. I have been completely unable to maintain any semblance of relationship on any level. I have been a bastard to the people who have actively attempted to deliver me from peril. I have been acutely undeserving of the ear that listen up and lip that kiss me on the temple. I have been accustomed to a stubborn disposition that admits it wish its history disassembled. I have been a hypocrite in sermonizing tolerance while skimming for a ministry to pretzel. I have been unfairly resentful of those I wish had acted different when the bidding was essential. I have been a terrible communicator prone to isolation over sympathy for devils. I have been my own worst enemy since the very genesis of rebels Today I pulled three ghost crabs out of rock and sand With a low time showcase of promised land I told them you were going to be something dynamic and impressive You are patient, you are gallant, you are festive Then I let them go You are listening to the 40 Ounce Hemlock Podcast, the antidote to academic poison. It just so happens we have a website, 40OunceHemlock.com. Click subscribe and big things will happen, we promise. This is the next to last episode of this series, Unmasking Antifa, and it's a long one, so let's get back to it. Oh my god! I don't know. Okay, this is going to be a little bit... This is going to be mildly hyperbolic. A little bit rhetorical. I don't know whether I don't do this whole podcast just for the opportunity to play some music at the breaks. <laughs> I mean, come on. What do you say? I have been completely unable to maintain any semblance of relationship on any level. I have been a bastard to those people who have actively attempted to deliver me from peril. I have been acutely undeserving of the ear that listen up and lip that kiss me on the temple. I have been accustomed to a stubborn disposition that admits it wishes history disassembled. Tear it down, tear it down, tear it down. But I digress. I have been a hypocrite in sermonizing tolerance while skimming for a ministry to pretzel. I have been unfairly rep... See? See? I have been unfairly resentful of those I wish that acted different when the bidding was essential. I have been a terrible communicator prone to isolation over sympathy for devils. I have been my own worst enemy since the very genesis of rebels. Sound like sound a little bit like Jack? You know, J- Jack with a little bit of introspection? But, sorry, on the point of being a terrible communicator. Remember in the, remember last episode, I, I feel like I kept asking. There's a few things that I do repetitively, I admit it. <laughs> I feel like I kept asking, for instance, uh about this, like, the explanation of the behavior. And, and, and here's a, for instance, the guy, you know, our, our paradigm example, the guy on the stage in the lecture hall who insists that all the best basketball players are from Norway despite any kind of counter evidence that you bring him, right? In other words, we're asking about the behavior of an ideologue. What's an ideologue? A person who is advancing a view as true in a way that is not subject to question or consequential question, right? Maybe it would feign entertaining a question, but in the substance of the answer to the question, the reply to the criticism, in the substance of that, you discover that there was never any countenance of the question in the first place because it's simply, the evidence given ends up to simply be a repetition of the ideology. It's like plugging your ears and saying the same thing over and over again, see? We're asking about the behavior of an ideologue. And we asked, why do they behave this way? Why are they seemingly impervious? I mean, that's the best word for this, right? Why are they impervious to counter-argument, to rational criticism, criticism, to any and all intellectual tools that a person might, with rational mind, a tool that they might use or attempt to use to get from 
error or potential error to truth? Why does it seem as if they're hmm, possessed? Right? I mean, that, at least that was the question. And we started to answer it, right? I mean, if, look, if you're dealing with someone that is so irrational in this way, it's like a really high degree of irrationality. Because it, 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 even in a second, a second level way, right? Because it, it, not only is it irrationality, but it, goes, it has that base covered within the theory. It defines itself as rationality itself and de- defines any and all opponents as contrary to science, contrary to logic, contrary to fact. Fake facts, right? See? That's where that comes from. This whole fake news thing is just an offshoot. Just you got to see, you got to understand the origins of these things, right? What did we say about, about Hegel a few episodes back? The student of his says, Professor, the, the, the facts don't fit your theory. And he's like, F the facts. I'll make them what I want, right? If you're dealing with this kind of irrationality, a rationality that is so conscious of itself, if, it's, if you're dealing with this kind of irrationality, well, you got to consider that you're dealing with something that's non rational, right? And if that's the case, then it's also very plausible. And you might want to consider that what you're dealing with is, is uh, psychological or, or spiritual. If you want to distinguish those two or if you want to conflate them, I don't care. You have to ask that question. You know what? Is this the right time to do this? Sometimes, okay, I, I started this series and then about like late into the series, I was like, you know what? I've never really watched like a documentary on, on Russia or communism or anything like that. I've just really only read about it. I, I guess I've maybe seen a movie here or there, but not, nothing that like immediately springs to mind, right? Um, so I got on YouTube and I watched these two documentaries a couple weekends back. And I watched one on St- Lenin and I watched one on Stalin. And man, I just want to almost play this. It's so great. Not that I feel like I need any validation, right? I'm above it. I don't need, <laughs> I don't cur. <laughs> I don't need validation, right? Um, yes, I do. Please give it to me. So I was watching this documentary on on Lenin, and this thing is said in the course of the documentary that I'm like, oh my gosh. It, this professor is being interviewed in the documentary, and he's asked why Vladimir Lenin, a, a Marxist, who in virtue of being a Marxist, believes that the revolution is inevitable. In other words, it's going to come about no matter what, no matter what you do, Right. Why would someone who believes that then fight so hard and expend so much effort in bringing about the revolution? You know, because that seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? That seems irrational. And this is his answer. Listen closely. Lenin was certainly a driven man uh, in the name of revolution. Why would a Marxist be so uh, intent on taking deliberate action and uh, forcing the revolution. Well, I say it's not, like, it's not logical, it's psychological. That in fact, a, a revolutionary is not a revolutionary because of his theory. He is a revolutionary because of uh, whatever his uh, instincts are. And the theory comes as a rationalization after the fact. A rationalization after the fact. The professor on the stage that explains to you how it is the case that Michael Jordan is in fact from Norway in virtue of the fact that he has this thesis that says all the basketball players are from Norway is giving you a rationalization after the fact. You see? So if that doesn't ring a bell, uh, what were we saying? You know, and I watched, sorry, now i got to keep interrupting myself. I've watched one on Stalin too. And... At one point, this guy is being interviewed who was sentenced to 10, 20 something years, 10 years in a concentration camp in Siberia because he was a tank driver in the military and his tank got stuck in a rut. So he was sentenced to 10 years or some odd years hard labor in a sub zero. <laughs> concentration camp I, I, sorry if i laugh when i say it it's like because i don't know what to do with it okay and he said this and i was like at the moment he said i was like i should really play it on the show because it should it bells you know like church bells like the big kind like in bat the last scene in batman you know, the big tower kind should be going off all right let me just play this real fast and then i promise i will get back to this point we're on terror became an everyday emotion as millions just disappeared from sight Every evening, 
nobody knew what's going to happen to him. Because the individual means nothing. The individual uh, is like a piece of sand in the big, big desert. You can run it over with a truck, you can, you can step on it, it just, you can crush it. It just means nothing. It means nothing, <laughs> right? I feel like we've talked about this. <laughs> Not just in this series, the previous series too. The individual means nothing. The individual does not matter. The individual is nothing. Huh. All right, look. Um, when you're dealing with something that's so irrational, you've got to consider the possibility it's non-rational. And if you're gonna, and then what are the options? It's psychological, or it's spiritual, or it's or they're one and the same. It's, it's something below the level of practical reason. And we started to answer, what is it, right? And what, what, what's the evidence? What's, is there any corroborating evidence that it's, it's psychological and spiritual in nature? I talked about this guy, this speaker from the Socialist Convention or something, or the National Convention in 1908, who, in the course of his talk, reveals that socialism is, or he advocates that socialism ought to be, to his fellow convention, convention go, goers. This is, the real, this, is the, this is the real thing. This is not like some, like, transient peripheral you know off the grid group this is the socialist party of america and he argues in the socialist convention of uh, the national convention national socialist convention 1908 he says that socialism ought to be a means of turning folks into atheists isn't that interesting he seemed to think that making socialists of people was an effective way, and he also seemed to think that a lot of his colleagues had this wrong, but nonetheless, he seemed to think that was an effective way to make atheists of people. And, well, he sure seemed as if the latter, right, making atheists of people, simply in the structure of his reasoning, makes that seem that that's the ultimate, that's the higher goal, of which socialism is simply then a tool or means, and he wants to counsel his colleagues about how best to use that tool. Let's just quote him again. Let's just quote him again. Listen to this. Comrades, no one will accuse me of any sympathy with Christianity as a church or as a religion. I am known in the United States as a materialist of the most uncompromising order. And I want it understood that my materialist dialectics, hang on to that word. Have I said that yet? Hang on to that word when I say dialectics because that's going to come back. Trust me, and you're going to hate it by the end of this episode. He says, I want it understood that my materialist dialect, if you don't already hate it, he says, I want it understood that my materialist dialectics do not permit me to forget the exigencies of the moment for our ideals in the far future. So he's saying, just because I'm, I, I have a vision for the future doesn't mean that I'm neglecting the, the things that are most pressing at the moment. So he goes on. He goes, would you expect to go out among the people of this country. Notice the emphasis on this country. Obviously, he's speaking in this country, but notice the sort of cat, the sort of strategy shift, like, like Marcuse, where they say, well, look, Marx said do it this way, but let's think on the ground here. This is, there's a big emphasis on tactics in communism, um, on the importance of tactics and the shifting strategies of various tactics and how to sort of have the right intuitions about when changing tactics is, is necessary and advantageous. And then there's a guy that comes along after some of the folks we're talking about here right before... Or the, the president that we spent some time talking about here, the previous guy, I can't remember his name. Um, that, a, a guy, a thinker who influenced him heavily, our previous president, um, basically made a career out of, wrote his most famous book about revolutionizing the tactics of a socialist. Anyway, more on that in a minute. Um, or maybe not, maybe next episode. He says, I want to understood that my materialist dialectics do not permit me to forget the exigencies of the moment for our ideas, our ideas in the future. Would you expect to go out among, among the people of this country, people of different churches, of many religious factions, and tell them that they must become atheists before they can be socialists? Now, let me just pause again there for the moment. This is perhaps the most important pause of all. Isn't it interesting that it's just assumed? He's out there trying to unearth and expose and turn over an assumption. So the assumption of what he's doing is that the thing that he's saying is commonly thought amongst his colleagues is in fact commonly thought amongst his colleagues. That's kind of phenomenal, isn't it? What is that thing? It's that 
we must first get men convinced of the rationality of our, our religious view before we can make them socialists. So that's apparently a thing that's thought. <laughs> Just if, if the point stopped there, that would be enough, right? But he not only exposes this point, and then he offers a, a counterposition, and the counterposition is just as fascinating as the original, from our perspective. He says, um, that would be nonsense, doing it that way. He says, we must first get these men convinced of the rationality of our economic and political program. And then, after we've made socialists of them, and members of the Socialist Party, then we can talk to them inside our ranks, talk of the higher philosophy and the, ready, this is, sorry, ready, the logical consequences of our explanation of society and nature. You know, I hadn't planned to emphasize that last two-word clause there. And nature. Wait, I thought this was an economic theory. And nature. Now, don't think when... When, when he says nature, he means birds tweeting and, and larvae, okay, <laughs> and the sun rising. He means the nature of reality. Those things that you were just thinking are just the phenomena. That's what scientists study. He means something much deeper. He means metaphysics. He means the nature of reality itself. And he would have to, let's just make this point too, he would have to, because to diagnose a norm, sorry, to prescribe rather, this comes after the diagnosis, to prescribe a norm for society, to say society ought to be this way. To say that in any effective, with any presumption of effectiveness or, or even coherence or sensibility, you would have to assume that society was the sort of thing that had constraints that governed its existence, how it ought to be, how it ought not to be. Objective constraints, Right. Objective constraints. Objective. What does objective mean? The same for everybody, anywhere, and always. Objective constraints. Objective ideas. Eternal ideas. Do you see? Marx. Okay? Let, let's get real clear on something. Because I want when, when, when Unterman here says, and nature, I really want you to appreciate what's being said here. We have to understand the difference between making a statement about the way the material world is and the way the material world ought to be. They're two fundamentally different kinds of statements. In fact, a little bit later in the show, we're going to be talking about David Hume. And it was David Hume that really brought this to light, much to the chagrin of his fellow atheists and skeptics, because it's a super annoying point for them. Uh, and, and, it, and it basically eats alive everything they try to do. Look, if I say to you, murder is wrong, well, what am I saying? I'm saying a person should not murder another person. Okay, now let's look at the structure of that statement. A person should not murder another person. Now, let's suppose that we're scientists for a second. All we're concerned with what actually does happen in the world. Like we go out, we go out and take data and record observations about what is happening in the world. But here, the word is could mean past, present, or future. Okay, so let's suppose that we're a particular kind of scientist, a sociological scientist. And we, we note that in the past there have been murders, and then we look at the present and we note that there are still murders, and then somehow maybe we get a time machine or something, right? We look at the future and, oh, lo and behold, there's murders in the future. So murder always has been happening, is happening, and will continue to happen. Now here's the core question. What does that do to the truth of the statement, a person ought not to murder? I'll give you a moment to think about it. What does it do to the truth of that statement? It does absolutely nothing. The two statements don't touch. The statement, a person ought not to murder, is not a statement about the past, is not a statement about the present, and is not a statement about the future. It is not a scientific statement. It is what they call a normative statement. And normative statements are what ethics and morality are made up of. Okay? So when a Marxist or anyone else tells you that society ought to be this way or that way, they are not being scientific because statements of that form cannot be verified scientifically. It would be true that murder is wrong or a person ought not to murder, irrespective of whether one murder or a million murders or a billion murders ever were, are, or will take place. Do you see? 
It's like two gears that don't touch. They have nothing to do with each other. Okay, so even if murder had never happened, that statement would still be true. And even if murder was always happening and will continue to happen, that statement could still be true. A person ought not to murder, right? So, that statement, a person ought not to murder, is essentially an eternal idea in the sense that it's not subject to, its truth, I should say, is not subject to the vicissitudes of what did happen, is happening, or will happen. Okay? Do you see? So Unterman and his fellow Marxists or his fellow socialists, when they, when they propose an idea about the way society ought to be, and here Unterman is saying, let's first get men convinced of this idea, and then we'll use that to convince them of atheism, right? When they, when they propose to you their vision of how society ought to be, they are appealing to normative statements. They are appealing to eternal ideas. The very thing that, as Marxists and socialists, they have to, out of the other side of their mouth, say, don't exist, you know what, in fact, this is actually exactly the problem that we were talking about that Jack had a few episodes back, where he's, he's, he's trying to march against these certain concepts that almost encapsulate the very cause for which he's marching, right? Or the, the basis of the cause on which he's marching. Um, there's a sort of self-contradiction problem there. This was, if I remember, if I remember right, this was where we were talking about the sort of tension in his view, and we kept saying, uh, something's got to give. So when Unterman speaks of the logical consequences of their economic theory, you know, when he says for society and nature, he's talking, the logical consequence, or one of the key, the crucial logical consequence he's talking about is the non-existence of God. What's ironic is that Unterman, like all atheists and socialists who talk about this, doesn't really realize that in, in his very act of talking about how society ought to be. He is appealing to the idea of society having a nature, a set of constraints that govern what it should, i.e. ought to be, which is to appeal to an objective idea, right? Like, you should not murder, right? It doesn't matter if it ever happened, did happen, or will happen, right? It's, it's, it's saying society is the sort of thing that ought to be this way irrespective of how you ever see it like actually playing out. This is how it ought to be, right? This is its true nature. But to say that a thing has a true nature is to say that there are objective ideas about it, pertaining to it, governing it, constraining it. But to say that is just to appeal to eternal ideas, which is precisely what, as a Marxist, you're supposed to not think there are. <laughs> It's very problematic. These folks never see it. They're too dim to see it. Anyways, so here we have the leading lights of the Socialist Party in America debating on, what was it? Oh, the most effective way to move the public towards atheism. And my point here is pretty simple. I'm sorry it's taking a long time to meander to it. Is My point is this. That is missionary fervor. That's psychological. That's spiritual. And, of course, the question that came up along the way is pretty interesting, too, right? We could ask why he thinks that particular strategic, or whatever you want to call it, methodological, you know, tactical, as we said, why that point is true. I mean, I think it's interesting just that it was said, right? But what's the reason, after you get over that shock, what's the reason that convincing someone that socialism is the correct socio-political doctrine or economic doctrine or however you want to mask it. Uh-oh. In case you're um, not following the series, it's called Unmasking it. Uh... Okay. Uh, what's the reason that convincing someone of that, that doctrine, that political doctrine, that sociological doctrine, that eco economic doctrine, what's the reason that convincing them of that is the most effective means of convincing them that God's existence is a falsehood. What could the two possibly have to do with each other such that merely doing the one was sufficient to be successful in the other? Or at least necessary to be successful in the other. Or maybe he doesn't say sufficient. All right. And the answer, as we move forward, is, should be, I think, actually, after all this discussion of Jack, I think it should be pretty clear. But if it's not, we'll keep chipping at it. Here's why. 
It's because it's an ideology. Have we used this word yet? Ideology? Have I said that? It's a religion. Socialism addresses questions, quietly in some cases, but nonetheless addresses questions, that previously the religious domain of life and thought and knowledge, whatever you want to call it, had addressed. Socialism, and this is why we had such a hard time categorizing it. Is it an economic theory? Is it a social theory? Is it a political theory? What exactly should we call it? It seems to have something to say about every aspect of life. It also seems to have a, a, a you know, blank like a clause, like an infinitely flexible clause within it that it can, it can address itself to anything. It just needs to identify some sort of oppression going on there, and then it can say, and, that, and, and I'm the answer to that. Right? It'll find that oppression too, because all the best basketball players are from Norway. Do you see? Once convince me that all morality and all justice and all abstract ideas, what Marx called eternal ideas, mocking those he disagreed with, once, once you convince me that all of those are really just manifestations of hunger, no, seriously, this is what Marx and Engels said. This is at, at bottom what it is, right? These are things are ultimately driven by our, the fact that, that our nature is what philosophers call appetitive. We have appetites. And that drives self-preservation, and self-preservation is the root of economics, says Marx. So I'm just, that, that's where it goes. All right? That's where it comes, rather, I should say in the logical sense, that's where it comes from. So if you convince me of that, well, then I'm, now I'm no longer lugging around these concepts that, I, you know, there's at least the possibility, the logical possibility, that, that, that the reality of God's existence might come so, go some distance in explaining. Now I can just drop those inconvenient requirements of explanation, right? Or I can say I've got an explanation for him. I mean, if you think about it, if true, this will explain why, going all the way back to our, our Jack story, at first he only thinks he's just, what, you know, moving away from belief in God, you know, losing his religion. Um, but in the end, he loses way more than that, right? Way more than just explicitly, like, creedal, you know, explicitly religious beliefs. Suddenly, he sort of discovers this about himself, he finds himself like skeptical of all morality, remember? And what and what else? Anywhere he encounters, how would you say, like a, anywhere he encounters like a rigid standard, his mind immediately re reinterprets what he sees, just like the professor in the lecture hall who uh, reinterprets all evidence contrary to the proposition that all the best basketball players are from Norway as evidence of the arbitrary imposition of a subjective standard by some people on other peoples, right? Um, suddenly he's got to be super critical of standards everywhere he seems to perceive them. And he just, this just happens, right? Well, you might understand after some discussion of Jack why that's useful to him, even if he, even if he doesn't fully understand it. Because to encounter a standard that could not be criticized this way or resisted this sort of criticism would start to put a dent in the, the world that he is trying to imagine for himself. Right? This non-theistic, this materialistic, this world that is not governed by an, a good, orderly, creative, and free mind. Right? Um, person. By mind, I mean person. And I don't mean with, with a femur and a tibula. That's not what I mean. <laughs> um, the, the socialist can't allow a foot in the door. They can't allow a counterexample. If there is a standard, like we said lately in this episode, we call it a constraint. If there, if there is a standard, a principle, a, a nature, a law, you know, an ordinance <laughs> that can't be explained away as like just society-based, relative, subjective, right? Or economically conditioned, as Marx says, as a pseudo-reality of one of these sorts. Well, why is this problematic? Because then maybe... It's not a pseudo-reality at all. Maybe it's a reality. You know, so for instance, maybe morality is a reality. What, what would that mean? Well, then we would run the risk of having to again consider what that meant about the way that reality, or as they used the word earlier, nature was structured. And perhaps consider God as the source of, the explanation of, that sustained an objective standard. Seemingly, as, to use Marx's word, eternal standard. 
And just like the, actually the evolutionists say in, in, about the same sort of issue, we can't let a divine foot in the door. All right? I just wanted, I know this came up at the end of last episode, and I felt we got to spend some more time on this question why they, are, they operate with such fervor and such pig headedness, or like, you know, like bullishness, right? Just obstinance. Just, I mean, it's very clear from the Unterman quote from the Socialist Convention. I mean, if it wasn't clear already, if it's not clear in a million, million other instances, it's very clear from the Unterman quote there is a religious intent. There's a religious you know, agenda. There's a religious motivation. Unterman's whole point is to place that motivation in the context of what will best accomplish the goal it has in mind. And he says, no, socialism first, then we'll make them atheists. This is a missionary. And that's why I said a little bit ago, it's as if they are possessed. And I didn't mean it offhandedly. All right. I mean, I, I mean it. They're possessed. Uh, Jordan Peterson loves to quote Carl Jung, who said, men don't possess ideas. Ideas possess men. All right. Now, before we're done here, and by that I mean with this series, we're going to then have to ask the question, well, then who is behind the idea? And we're going to unmask Antifa. Hey, listen, the devil takes many shapes and forms. The devil takes many shapes. We'll be right back. So, <laughs> the chaos in the streets is preceded by a chaos in the mind. And the chaos in the mind is a purposeful creation of the quote-unquote intellectuals that we've been discussing for so many episodes now. It's a purposeful creation. And it's meant to facilitate and engender and create chaos and confusion. And the K, I I mean, we just, look, Professor Bike Lock is a perfect illustration of so much that we've been saying. Is he not? This is a professor, a college professor of ethics, who sees fit when he hears a view expressed in a public forum, in a public place, a view that he disagrees with, that he finds threatening to his framework, that he finds threatening. And we just talked a little bit about what's threatening about it, right? Can't let a foot in the door. When he hears a view expressed, his inclination is to smash, to bludgeon the speaker over the head with a blunt object. I'm sorry, not the speaker. Seven or eight speakers on seven or eight separate occasions over the head with a U-lock bike lock, a heavy steel object, to try to kill them. I mean, his inclination is violence. Right? And when asked, if, if, if that's really, I mean, even tactically, pragmatically, that, that's really the way he thinks he should be going about it, he says, what? Well, I don't have to worry about the moral argument that what I'm doing is immoral, because why? Because morality is a construct of the narrative class. It's a construct. It's not a reality. 
Marx would be proud. Morality is a construct of the bourgeoisie, the rich, right? Marcuse would be proud. That was Marcuse's whole position, too. They both would be proud. So the chaos and the confusion is a purposeful creation. And it results in exactly what we've said it's intended to result in. The death of Western society. Like Heidegger and Marx and so many other people that we've heard from and more that we haven't. The death of Western society. That's the goal. Now, let's just be clear for a moment. Remember, the death of your society, the death of your world, okay? You, you got to make this personal for a moment. When someone tells you that they intend to kill you, there's probably two important questions that should just be like at the forefront of your mind. Why and how? Why do they want me to die? And a little bit more pressingly, how do they intend to see to it that I do so? Right? In a life and death situation, that latter question is far more important. If someone's trying to kill you, then, well, it's worthwhile to know why. The more urgent question, the more urgent issue is stopping them from killing you. Sorry, I know, I, I know I'm, I'm being pretty thick rhetorically here, but just think about this. You can't stop them unless you know how they're planning to do or how they're trying to do what they're trying to do. If you think they're going to try to kill you with a gun and you therefore decide to wear a bulletproof vest, but it turns out that their plan is to slit your throat, well, then your efforts to protect yourself are wasted. You know, don't bring a bulletproof vest to a knife fight or something, right? That's why we have to look at the how. And I don't want to just stop at chaos and confusion. There's more to say. It's not that we're neglecting the why. It's just that I think that we've basically really identified it for the most part. They want you to suffocate and die. They want your community, your country, your culture, whatever, destroyed. Why? They want this because they hate it and you. Why? They hate you because you have, among other things, most importantly, you have political freedom. That's why they hate you. You as the individual in our society, under our constitution, are fundamental. Not the group. You, the individual. They hate that. Why? They hate that because it means that they can't use the power of government to control you. They want to control you. Why? Why do they hate that? Why do they hate not being able to control you? They hate it because they have a character. A, uh-oh, uh-oh, a spirit a psychology, whatever you want to call it, that has a deeply ingrained need for power and control of other people. Why do they have that? Well, they, ha uh -huh. Uh -huh. they have that because, you know, well, we'll get to it. Um, anyway, that's the why. But we want to talk about how. How do they intend to kill you? It's a good thing to know. And we've started to see part of the answer. Chaos and confusion. Which at the social, you know, cultural level, is to a society what a disease is to a, an organism, right? They want to kill your society by infecting it with a disease. Making it unworkable, unlivable. And therefore bringing about it to death. Heard from Heidegger, heard from Marx. And like I said, we can enumerate a lot of others. They want an entirely new socio-political system, a new society. And you don't get that until the old one has been completely torn down. Or, you know, pick your metaphor, torn up from the roots, eradicated. This is what makes it radicalism. They want everything torn down. And, and out of the chaos that a collapse like that precedes or is preceded by, you could say on both ends, right? They want to erect this new society that they have this vision for, right? 
So chaos and confusion are just, remember what Marx called them, the bloody birth pangs of the new socio-political order. Which one is that? You know. The socio-political order where you as an individual are completely owned by the government, by the state. Your land, your property confiscated, your family broken up, your kids removed from your primary care and guidance and turned into you know, spies against you for the government. Your wife shared among you know, any, any and all in society who might wish to have her because everything's shared because you know, marriage and family are the evil root of capitalism. And you're reduced to a servile cog in a gigantic blind political mechanism with all the affairs and activities and occupations and interests and hopes and dreams and aspirations and pastimes and potentials and everything else pertaining to you all now dictated to you by the government for your own good. Sorry. Here's, here, here it is better. For the good of society. That political order. That's the one they want. Just read the manifesto. Anyway, let's press on the how question. Let's go further. They want to destroy society by way of chaos and confusion, but how do they intend to bring about the chaos and confusion? And the answer to that question is what we got to get clear on here. Because as we've said, and as these thinkers that we've been highlighting have pointed out, it's very hard. we got the garbage trucks outside right now. It's hard to bring about that kind of disarray. Directly, to directly bring about that kind of disarray, chaos and confusion, in a society where the prospects of getting enough dissatisfied, disaffected, dispossessed people together, you know, to bring about an actual revolution in violent fashion, you know, pitchforks and Molotov cocktails and all that, it's hard to do in a society like this. How do you do it? And what they said in answer to that question The way you inject Marxism into a country like this, into a society like this in America, where you just are unlikely to get that direct incitement of violent revolution because all the motivators towards it don't exist or or don't exist to the degree that would be necessary to, to kick off that kind of thing, right? People are largely free, largely prosperous, largely hopeful, at least, largely well, they're largely happy. Unlike Jack, right? They're largely happy. Now, what is the Frankfurt School going to do about that? How are you going to bring about this chaos and confusion and thereby this revolution in a society full of people like that? How? You remember when Jack's view begins to change? What does he do? He starts criticizing everything. Everything, right? Everywhere that Jack looks, he sees deception. Everywhere there's excellence, Jack sees oppression. He starts suspecting that he's the only one with reflection and uses this to justify his own lack of direction. He starts criticizing everything. It goes on, right? It's like everyone is the question and Jack is the answer. In fact, Jack's got a theory that people are like a cancer. Anyway, Jack begins to criticize everything. As soon as he's lost the basis, in actuality, to criticize anything. He doesn't realize that yet, but like we said, something's got to give, and Jack's got to find, as as he begins to discover it, he's got to find a new, total view of the world in which to recast his criticisms. a, A new framework to uphold his criticisms so that they at least have the veneer of coherence. And that's what socialism is. It's not just an economic theory, but it's a total view of human life, of human activity, human meaning. Here we're making the transition here. Keep that in mind. Meaning and so forth. And this is why in order to bring it about, in order to bring about socialism, everything must go. Everything must be torn down. Jack begins to criticize everything. And what do we see in the episode called Tenure Track Jacks? These communists who come to American shores just before World War II or during World War II, they they did call their little fashionable intellectual fad that they started, right? What did they call it? Critical theory. It was meant to criticize everything in a way that looked academic and intellectual, but which we'll see in in a minute is nothing of the sort. And whose instruction were they following in doing so? 
That was Karl Marx, who said, Here is what we have to accomplish. The ruthless criticism of all that exists. Oh, just wanted to drop that in. Drop that gem in there for you. That's Karl Marx. I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> These guys were Marxists. Taking Marx's doctrine, his fundamental idea, dressing it up in academic clothing, and spreading it to a culture via academia in hopes of spreading chaos and confusion, in hopes of destroying that culture. But how is the chaos and confusion infused at the sort of psychological, cultural, social, mental level? We're going to press on that question here. And as we do, I want you to think about another gentleman from back in that era. Gentleman is a stretch. A guy named Willy Munzenberg. Another German intellectual at the time. Worked closely with members of the Frankfurt School. Very closely. He worked with them on this, this project. He had the same vision of pushing Marxism in at the cultural level. Willy Munzenberg, founder of the Comintern, the Communist International, which openly advocated for any and all means necessary to establishing world communism, world collective control of all people. Any and all means, including armed terrorism. Willy Munzenberg said this. Just one line. Just going to read you a line. He said a lot, but he said this. We must organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western society stink. See what, see, what, see what I'm doing here? I don't want you to think that I'm not making this stuff up. It's not just me like, you know, sitting back in my creaky chair at my desk, like speculating about the ultimate origins. This is, this, this is them talking. I'm using their words to illustrate what I'm trying to draw out for you. This was the purpose of critical theory as founded by the Frankfurt School. And this is the purpose of the scores of offshoots, that some of which we've touched on in past episodes. These scores of offshoots of critical theory that have come about since and been penned and pushed by academics since that time. This is the purpose, to make society stink. What, is, what does that mean? To make it unlivable. How? By setting everyone against one another. How? By convincing everyone that any, follow this now, any remotely identifiable assertion of a true nature, or and thus a true Standard. Don't say there's a nature of manhood. Don't say the, don't say there's a nature of maleness these days, right? It's, it's all about gender. Don't say there's a true nature to that, right? Any assertion of a true nature and thus a standard of anything is only really the arbitrary oppression of one group by another because all standards are human made, just like Professor Bikelock says. And therefore, if there's to be Real justice, notice the, notice the irony there. What, what's real justice? If it's all man-made, what's real justice? If there's to be real justice in the world, justice in society, oh, 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 social justice. If there's to be that, never mind that that very concept is incoherent on the grounds we stated, but if there's to be that, everything must be torn down. We must organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western society stink. Incidentally, Munzenberg, despite all his valuable contribu contributions, <clears throat> one of which we've just emphasized, despite all this, despite his strategic genius in transposing Marxism to cultural Marxism via academia in concert with the Frankfurt School's critical theorists, despite his unwavering commitment to revolution to the point of advocating for armed terrorism, Munzenberg was later murdered by Joseph Stalin, just like everybody else. And he would then go on to decay in a I'm sure, a mass grave somewhere, which I guess maybe if you're a collectivist, it's not a bad way to go. Not unlike what he wished to see America do, die and decay. Uh, we must organize the intellectuals to make Western society stink, to make it unlivable, to cause its death, to bring it to such a fevered pitch of chaos and confusion, of bitterness and strife, of dissatisfaction and envy, of hatred and accusation of oppression, and thus, conversely, hey, 
Note this as well. Conversely, what's the converse of oppression or an upshot of it? To fill it with such a fevered pitch of entitlement. Wait, what do you mean, Nick? You haven't said entitlement yet in this entire series. Here we are, episode 14, you're saying entitlement? Listen, entitlement is just the flip side of the coin of oppression, right? To make it so full of this vitriol and this poison that it collapses of its own weight, collapses of its own fatigue, collapses from the stench of its own decay, collapses in chaos and confusion. Just like Heidegger said, just like Marx and everyone since Marx who follows Marx has called for. So we're going to look really specifically for a moment at perhaps the most insidious and, and, and definitely the most, oh, the most devilish weapon in the arsenal of this assault on society. This is really, really crucial to a discussion of how academic Marxists have moved this project along. And we just can't get to our final point without spending time on this. The how. How is the chaos and confusion, first in the mind of the individual and then in the society itself, perpetuated? How is it created? Well, here, generally, as we've said so far, it's done by being promulgated by people of academic standing in important positions, you know, with important academic friends, occupying important, supposedly important, you know, luxurious academic positions, atop academia, amid important academic institutions, you know, and pushed in one form or another, you know, with the innumerable different faddish variations on critical theory that we've, we've talked about. But if the whole... Now, this is... Okay, I know I keep saying how... We're going to come to the how, and I, I keep pushing forward and pulling back. But listen, just think about this. If the whole game of an ideologue is as obvious as I'm here making it sound, in, in for instance, the thought experiment, all the best basketball play, players are from Norway, right? With the professor on stage de- defending his thesis that all the best basketball players are from Norway, in a fashion that that's obviously not a defense at all. It's just you know reassertion and reassertion and reassertion. If he's not even amenable or cognizant of the need for evidence, if the whole game is that obvious, then how does this larger project of academic radicalism, you know, and its myriad subprojects, as exemplified by all those theories that we talked about, how does it get off the ground? How's it pulled off? Here's how it's done. This is the how. You ready? It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna sound anticlimactic, but it's it's very important. Here it is. Meaninglessness. That's the how. So we got to talk about meaninglessness. All right. And now maybe you might see why I began with the so-called affair at the beginning of this episode. But if not, don't worry. It all will be explained. All right. And we'll be right back and explain it. This is where the spinal cord exits the skull. You are listening to the 40 Ounce Hemlock Podcast. Find us at 40OunceHemlock.com where you can click subscribe and roll with us legit. (laughs) This is part 14 of Unmasking Antifa and it's a long one. First hour and a half is over. There's another hour and a half to go. So if you got to take a break and come back to it, this might be an ideal time to do it. Regardless, we're gunning it. Pedal to the floor, so let's get back to it. You know he only eats meat? That's all he eats? No. Yeah, he's on this carnivore diet. Really? No vegetables at all. Nothing. Salt and meat and water. Wow. Yeah, he's so wacky with it. He told me that he had like a a glass of cider and he couldn't sleep for 24 days. Like, he's... Oh. He's not okay. <laughs> he's he's eccentric, like in, no, I mean, in, a, in a heavy way. Yeah, he's a, he's a heavy guy. Yeah, but um, it's 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 a burden. Being that guy is a burden. Well, don't you feel historically that they're, they're the people who are the most yes. sad and broken and 
Because they know too much. <laughs> There's nothing worse than knowing shit. <laughs> I used to say that, say that to kids when I was coaching them, when I was coaching uh, martial artists. Uh -huh. I would say, you're scared because you're smart. Yeah. You see these people around you that aren't scared? They're yeah. stupid. Of course. They don't understand the possibilities. You're aware of the dangers and all the variables. You got to put that aside. Yes. And just concentrate on your technique and your task at hand. Sure. But the reason why you're scared is because you're smart. You know. Well, there's more to say. After all, what is just saying meaninglessness supposed to prove or explain or whatever, right? Um, to answer that question, and look, I'm going to slow down a little bit here. You might be like, slow down. What are you talking about? We're hours into this. I'm going to slow down a little bit here. This is episode 14, right? The last bit of episode 14 before episode 15, and that's the end. And I have something I have to accomplish by the end. And the only way I can see of accomplishing it right now is saying, I'm going to slow down for a second here. Um, why? Because, look, I've been trying to pepper this, you know, my, my long uh, bouts of talkativeness. I've been trying to frame them with some quotes for you that have, I think, I hope, guided the discussion. Uh, and I'm, I'm going way back here to, to also to very recently. I'm talking about everything from Thrasymachus, you know, on down later. We talked a lot about he Heidegger, multiple quotes from Marx, that really interesting quote from Unterman at the uh, Socialist Convention in 1908, saying, look, I know we want to make atheists of them, but let's make socialists of them first, right? The, Unter the Unterman quote, the Munzenberg quote that we just got to, um, what was the Munzenberg quote? Remember the founder of the Comintern worked closely with Herbert Marcuse, who we spent a lot of time on a couple episodes ago. We even talked to him a little bit. The Munzenberg quote, we must organize the intellectuals to make society and use them to make society stink. Right? And this, this, this brought Heidegger immediately back to mind. Chaos and confusion, suffocation, right? Demise. There's been quotes from Marcuse, as well, that, you know, corroborate and are consistent with and illuminate all these others that we've talked about. Oh, and don't, don't forget Professor Bike Lock, <laughs> as long as we're running down the list, right? Don't forget Professor Bike Lock and the, what he had to say, which is just essentially what has been said by all these guys, right? And what did he say? He said, I'm not worried about the moral high ground. Morality itself is a construct of the narrative class. In other words, Marx, there are no eternal ideas of justice and goodness. It's all subjective. And it's subjectively controlled. It's controlled like the, like the, like the, like the, uh, the connotation, the meaning of those terms is controlled. And now this goes all the way back to Thrasymachus, right? This was, this was, you know, 2000 years before the, right? Justice is just the advantage of the stronger. This is the same thing Marx says. Same thing all these guys say. Same thing Prof Professor Bikelock is saying. Morality is just a construct of the narrative class. Well, what's the narrative class? I hear Marx and those guys talk about the narrative class. The narrative class just is the bourgeoisie. It just means who's ever in control. He's saying the same thing. 2,000 years earlier, Thrasymachus, talking to Socrates, justice is just the advantage of the stronger. I say all this in order to say I've been trying to frame these long meandering discussions. You know, it's a long episode. There's been a few long episodes here and there's a worry for me. It's like there's content I want to present and there's a worry. It's like, well, how deep do you go? I'll have to ask that same question here in a moment with something, something we're going to talk about. But the key point here is what we're talking about as we close out this episode is an exploration of this short answer, this quippish answer I just gave, meaninglessness. Okay? And I know I've said 50 times we got to talk about meaninglessness. But there's been some stuff that needed to be said first. So let's talk about meaninglessness. And to do it, I don't want to, I don't want to go far into this, but I, I got to mention it, right? Think, think back to the fable. Uh, you know, it, not, not Aesop or Brothers Grimm or, um, uh, well, actually another contemporary of some of the folks we've talked about, Hans Christian Andersen. Think back to the fable of the emperor's new clothes. I'm not going to, I'm definitely not going to read the whole thing. 
not even going to rehearse the whole thing for you. I just want you to think about an aspect of it. You know, you got the swindlers, those guys who come to town and play upon the, the king's insecurities and perhaps possible, you know, illegitimacies. Um, and they play upon his vanity. And then in doing so, they pull sort of this, this scam over the whole kingdom. The scam that is eventually exposed by someone who, everyone else who was wittingly or unwittingly particip participating in this scam, um, it's eventually foiled by this one person who all of those folks would, would think as simplistic and simple-minded and not sophisticated and unintelligent and uninformed and a child, right? But that's not the part I want to focus on here. The part I want to focus in, on here is what is said, or rather, the way what is said is said by all the folks who are, and like a moment ago I just allowed, wittingly or unwittingly per participating in the perpetuation of this proposition that the man is not buck-ass naked, right? How do they talk? When they're affirming the proposition, how do they talk? Do they just say, yes, he's wearing clothes? No, they don't do that, do they? What do they do? They describe the clothes in great detail, with high talk, in elaborate, you know, and adoration and, 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 and fine, and, and, you know, observation of the fine, fineness and minutiae of the garment and the decorations and the, and, and the accessories and the, right? It's very descriptive. It's thick with, with, with detailed description, right? Why? Well, I mean, in a sense, you know, you're standing there in front of Kim Jong, whoever, whatever the guy, you know, his son, either one of them. Um, and you're asked, you know, is he good? Is he a good ruler? Is he a good leader? You don't just say yes, right? If, I mean, if you want some insurance that you go on and on, you belabor the point. You accentuate it and exaggerate it and decorate it with high, you know, show that you believe it, right? Now, this is what is happening. I know we haven't talked a lot about the actual content of all of these theories that keep coming up as we talk about the effect of Marx on academia. But when you come to the content, the writing itself, it all, one and all, and you know, just to vary, varying degrees, and at the limit, well, you're going to see the limit tonight. You're going to see it. But at the limit, it is insanely, not just verbose, but dense and just packed with terminology and vocabulary and vernacular, oftentimes invented ad hoc. And, then, and, and, and worse, sometimes treated as if it's not being invented ad hoc, right? Um, in other words, just using words as if they exist, which don't actually exist. It takes place in this style of language that has to give you pause and think back to this aspect of The Emperor's New Clothes by Hans Christian Andersen that we've just, we've just touched on. It has to give you pause. Because the same thing is going on. What is being said is said in such belabored, elaborate, verbose, just... I, I, well, you're going to see it. I don't know any other way to describe it. Uh, fashion. That there really is, I mean, to the honest mind, to the child, perhaps, there really is, or one who is just not infected with the, whatever the motives are that, are, that bring about the, the self-deception, just doesn't have that, whatever it is that triggers that. And the child just, no, he's not, he's not actually wearing any clothes, right? The language that all this stuff is written in is so thick, so meaningless. I, I believe I, I don't mean meaningless here, like, oh, there's some purpose to what's being said, but it's kind of clouded in some spots, and some of the conclusions aren't quite, they don't quite follow the premises with the sort of like necessity that the author implied. No, I don't mean like that. I don't mean there's, there's mistakes. I don't mean there's points of unclarity. It's literally that the whole thing is meaningless start to finish. And oftentimes, oftentimes, listen to this, knowingly so. I mean, you can't really propound a theory that 
all language is ultimately objectively meaningless, right? And hope that you're going to come across as having said something meaningful. And some of these theories and some of these more sort of like uh, snarky, not snarky, but punchy, some of these more, the, the guys who are more ideologically aggressive who write in this tradition will, will admit that like, like uh, Derrida, will flat up say, or Stanley Fish, will flat up admit it, the flat out admit it and go on about the game regardless, describing the clothes in elaborate, elaborate ador- adoration and detail, right? Um, so what am I trying to say here? We have to talk about meaninglessness. And to do so, I want you to see how... I'm not going to read a lot to you. Don't worry. But this is important. This is really important. Why? We have to take the mask off Antifa. Just listen. I've been trying to frame this thing in quotes. Okay? I know I go off on these things. But I've been trying to give you these pieces that sort of like some dots to, to, as we draw the map. There's one more or two. One and a half or two coming at the end. The one is the crucial thing. So don't think that we're just going to... We're going to meander off onto this, into the sunset here. Stay with me. Okay? But we got to get there. Just, so just think about this aspect of the Emperor's New Clothes. And I want to share with you a little of how this work is written. Okay? And make some observations about it. But! <laughs> Sorry. I- I'm laughing. It's sort of a nervous laughter because I'm wondering how many times you'll let me do that. What's going on with my mic here? In order to do that, we have to talk for a moment about Hegel. And now I'm wondering how many times you're going to let me do that, because we've done this before, I think in the, what was it the 1985 episode, a few episodes back? Um, we got to do this real quick. And we got to do this because Hegel, uh, the German romantic philosopher, not, not romantic in the romantic sense, but romantic in the non-romantic sense, <laughs> is really important. Um, how can I say this? He's really important for understanding how the meaninglessness that we're talking about here is, is affected, is pulled off, okay? Um, how it's done, you know, in order to serve the purpose that we've here ascribed to it, okay? So I'm going to try to do that here very briefly in the next few minutes. If you study the history of, if you study the history of philosophy, there's, you could make the argument that there's certain times, certain eras in the history of philosophy that focus more on certain kinds of questions rather than other rather than others. Now, whatever. That may be true, maybe not. There's certainly a sense in which it seems true. It might be revisionist. It might be confirmation bias. It might be right. All these things. But there's a sense in which, there's a very legitimate sense in which it's it's plausible to say that. Um, So, for instance, the pre-Socratics, like going way, way back, like before Socrates, they were all concerned with metaphysics. And that just means with being, like with existence. Like, what is it? What is the stuff the world is made of? And they had all sorts of different kinds of answers to that question. Okay. And then when Socrates and Plato and Aristotle come around, um, they too are concerned with those questions, but they co- become like more explicitly, uh, more self-consciously aware of the epistemological parts of those questions. Okay, the, the theory of knowledge, like how do we know these things? Not just so, not just existence and being are they thinking about now, but knowledge. Okay, and then after uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, you get these subsequent Greek movements um, where the the focus becomes in way way more ethical. Okay, so there's different times, different different eras in philosophy, and they tend to focus more on different kinds of questions. When you come to the uh, as a, another, for instance, the early the the the, the medieval period, or like Thomas Aquinas and whatnot, the medieval period, uh, very very focused on epistemology. Okay, in addition to all sorts of theological topics, and and seeing a lot of philosophical topics through a theological lens, uh, but nonetheless very focused on epistemology and metaphysics of, metaphysics of mind. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't want to get too far too far afield here. Um, in the early modern period, and, and sometimes it's confusing what that means. The early modern period is like from the, from, it's like the Enlightenment. You know, it's like from the scientific revolution through the Enlightenment. It's like 1600s to the 1800s. Um, in the early modern period, it becomes really, really, really focused on epistemology. How do we know what we know? Okay. And if you listen to the Charlie Gard series, the series prior to this one, you know that there was, we mentioned this there. There's two basic answers to that question. I mean, there's all sorts of you know sub questions and so on and so forth. But there's two basic answers that folks came to um, in, in debating that question. And one side was called the rationalist, and the other side was called the empiricist. And the rationalists are like, yeah, you know, 
Some of our knowledge is informed by our senses. In fact, a lot of it, you could even argue most of it. However, there are conceptual truths and there's logical truths and mathematical truths and things like this uh, that we are able to arrive at and that rightly constitute, constitute knowledge that cannot be coherently traced back to sense experience. It, it's done in our mind. We have this faculty, this rational faculty. Okay, So these folks are called the rationalists, and uh, against them were the empiricists. And the empiricists were like, no, 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 you may think that, but really the real story is all of our knowledge, everything begins with sense experience in the world, empirical, in other words, empirical experience, okay? Why are you talking about this, Nick? I'm talking about this because there's a big back and forth throughout this, these several hundred years between all these guys, Descartes and Hume and Hobbes and Locke and Berkeley and Malbranch and like all the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth among all these guys, okay? Rationalists versus the empiricists. And at the end comes a guy named David Hume, who's an empiricist. And looking back, if you take the whole debate you know, in view. It's very clear that Hume sort of brings down the curtain on this whole debate, okay? Now you might think, well, good, then we arrived at some sort of decision. We arrived at some sort of truth on the matter, and now we know how knowledge, you know, what knowledge at bottom is constituted by and how it's formed. Are we good here? No, we're not, because Hume is famous, or you might even say infamous, is notorious as a sort of like, I don't know what you would call it, like an anti-hero of philosophy or like, like a, he was an extremely consistent philosopher, but he argued so consistently from his empirical premises that what he ended up doing was because of his perspicuity, because of his acumen, because of his sharpness, he was a good philosopher. He discovered that when you begin where he wanted to begin, you ended up in all sorts of absurdities that could not support the th- do the theoretical work of supporting what we commonly believe our scientific practice and knowledge of the world to require. See the problem? So if you take a really, really rigorous empirical view about wh- where knowledge comes from, you end up, seems on Hume's account, destroying science. And folks got really upset with this. They got really upset with Hume about this because you know, pe- folks wanted to be empiricists, but his, his empiricism carried to its logical conclusion had all sorts of absurd consequences for science, okay, or for the theory of science, rather you should say. So at the end of the Enlightenment, another guy comes along, a German guy named Immanuel Kant, and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Right? He, sees what, he sees how Hume has concluded and the sort of havoc that Hume has wrought. And Kant's like, I'm going to fix this. Okay, hang on, I got to take a sip of coffee. So to fix the problem that he perceived was at bottom of the situation that Hume created. In other words, you know, in his view, in his to put knowledge, I mean, specifically science, but to put knowledge in general back on the pedestal that we take it to have, I and mean, we do believe we have some sort of knowledge of the world how, in, in whatever small measure, and it's, and it's accruing in some sense, right? We're, we're getting somewhere with all this, right? To, to fix what he saw as the damage that Hume had done, not, you know, not mischievously, well, mischievously, that Hume, Hume was mischievous, but he was, he was consistent. It was the other empiricists that weren't being consistent. Hume just pointed that out and came to all these, like we said, absurd, crazy conclusions about our knowledge of the world, or rather our lack thereof, okay? Conclusions that did not square with what we commonly, what we take, you know, look, the scientific revolution had just happened. Isaac Newton had just happened supposedly our knowledge of the world was at some sort of like zenith or inflection point, right? I mean, this was the scientific revolution. Then here comes Hume, and he's like, actually, you know, if if you take seriously the kind of beings that we're supposing we are, and you take seriously how we intake knowledge of the world, you can never support the sort of like assumptions that that are underpinning all of our scientific practice. So, you know, what's up? I'll be in back if you need me. You know, it's like, um, so Kant comes along, and he's like, I'm going to fix this, okay? So Kant, undertakes this huge project of trying to solve the problems that Hume, who has become a byword, almost a four-letter word to a lot of, a lot of serious philosophers and natural scientists, natu- natural philosophers as they were known in the period, because they're just so frustrated with his conclusions, because they want to believe, and they should believe, right, in the advance and the glory of science. And Hume did too, but he also was adept enough of a philosopher to show that 
what he wanted to believe about science could not square with what he wanted to believe about the nature of humanity and the nature of reality and the reality in which that humanity lives and moves and has its being. But the thing is, what Kant has to end up doing, did I, was that a horrifically formulated sentence? What Kant ends up doing in order to fix it is something that in hindsight, and you you look at it and you end up wondering it was was that worth it? I mean, did we, you know he ends up many will argue giving up way too much in order to try to fix the damage that he see, sees Hume as having done. And what I mean by that is that up to this point, it was just assumed by all parties to the debate, any sort of debate about what the human mind is, like what are we talking about here, right? All parties to the debate that the human mind, whatever it was however it worked, rather, was, of course, a sort of receptacle. It was a, here's another word, a sort of, it was a passive entity. What does that mean? Well, it's like a mirror. You know, it, it, it did stuff, but it only did stuff in virtue of having stuff to do with, right? And it got that stuff from the outside world. It didn't make it. It took it in. It received it. It's a receptacle, okay? It was assumed by all parties to the debate, and it, because it's very intuitive, I mean, that's what we take our minds to be, right? That the mind was a passive receptacle of all this sense experience and, and, and just, you know, all the, all the contents of thought. And in order to fix what he sees Hume as having done, Kant has to change that. And on, I mean, I'm not going to go into this. Right? There's not time or room to go into this deep here, but I, I, I got to say just enough to get where we're going with Hegel. Kant ends up having to say, I'm not going to fully explain why this is the case. All right, just bear with me. Kant ends up having to say that the human mind in some sense is, is contributing to that which it perceives. Now, even here, without me like fully expounding this, right, you can see the trouble that's brewing, you know, the human mind is not just receiving the world. So it's not like a receptacle, an experience of the world, and just mental experience as such isn't just a sort of like experience of an effect of some sort of cause external to the mind itself. Rather, the contents of, of thought, that the mental experience and experience of the world, and therefore all of our, it's, it's in part that, but it's also contributed to by the mind itself. And the moment you hear that, you got to go. Well, wait a second. I mean, if if, if we're going to be if we're going to be rigorous, if we're going to be consistent, if we're going to be right, how much? You know what? <laughs> right? And okay. In other words, the problem that everybody sees with this is that it puts a barrier of unknown depth, of unknown thickness. It puts a barrier, an imp- and therefore an impenetrable barrier between the subject, i.e. the human mind, and the object, the thing known. It's like, well, we can know the world as we experience it, but we can't know what it's really, 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 really like, what actual reality actually, actually is like, actually, you know, because that would require us to know what things were like independently of experience, but we we only know things as we experience them, and our experience contributes something to them. So they are inevitably and invariably and irrevocably changed, or so we have to suppose, by our experiencing them. We'll never know what's on the other side of the wall, okay, the, of the Iron Curtain. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, just let's keep it with this, this series, right? Okay, so that's, now that's the, now so Kant has Kant really solved, you know, everybody was worried that Hume's problems created all this skepticism, and then here comes Kant, and he's like, I got this, man. <laughs> and Kant, and then you get this Iron Curtain, between the human mind and everything it, it had heretofore supposed it knew or could potentially know, right? So now you can see why now we have a new problem and someone new has got to come on the scene and remedy this, and that person is Hegel. Now, we've talked about Hegel before. I believe it was in the 1985 episode, part of the series, one of the middle, middling episodes called 1985. we got to say a little bit more about him here. Hegel is so crucial to understanding the Marxists. Okay, and I want to, if nothing else, um, just get you to see a little bit of why that's the case here. He's so crucial. Okay, so we have to say this. We have to try to capture what it is that Hegel does to solve the problem that Kant left him with after what Kant did to try to solve the problem that Hume left everybody with. 
got to say a little bit about this because it will make possible understanding what the academic leftists we're talking about are doing in these books and journal articles and papers and articles when they're writing in the style that we're going to describe. It will help you understand how they're accomplishing what we've here said. I made this audacious claim, right? What they're, what they're trying to accomplish. Chaos and confusion via meaninglessness for the purpose of political revolution, for the purpose of the communist state. Okay? Let's be clear. <laughs> as, as a famous communist once said. Um, and again, remember how we started this section. We started this section by saying that the history of philosophy sort of moves in these phases and at different times, in different eras, the, you know, people, philosophers get sort of hung up on different kinds of questions. And this early modern slash modern period in philosophy from about 1600 to eight, about 1800-ish gets really hung up on epistemological questions, okay, meaning theory of knowledge. Can we know anything? If we can, what can we know? And how do we know that, you know? <laughs> It sounds simple, but it's it's extraordinarily difficult when you start working through it. Um, and we saw all of this discussion, you know, as as we sort of briefly highlighted it. We saw all of this discussion culminate in Kant essentially saying, "Well, yes and no. We can know things as they appear to us. We can know appearances. We can know things as we experience them. But we'll never be able to get beyond that to the world or reality as it is." in and of itself. Why? Because our mind is just the sort of thing that conceptually contributes to that which it perceives, so anything that we hold before our mind is going to have some residue of our mind's activity on it. So we're, we're going to be seeing partly the world, and we're going to be seeing partly what we've done to the intake of experience of the world, right? And, and, and how are you going to tell the difference between the two? You're not. You, you, you can just know appearances. So Kant, it's like, did he really save us from Hume's skepticism, right? A sort of, you know, he, Kind of, but not really. And a lot of people are unsatisfied with this because it's like, okay, well, now we have this wall between us and, I mean, Kant, isn't this what we've been trying to do all along is know if we can actually know actual reality? And now you're like, no, but yet you're saying, yes, you've solved the problem. You haven't solved the problem. All right. Hegel's like, no, you haven't solved the problem. Um, Because again, once you say the mind, what the mind perceives is a modification of what it takes in then you got this, this Iron Curtain problem. So here comes Hegel to solve Kant's problem. But Hegel is not effing around. Hegel's not like tweaking <laughs> minor details of ideas that have come before him. He is offering, no, Hegel is foisting an entirely new, supposedly complete thoroughgoing system of thought onto the world. What do I mean by system? If you're not, if you haven't been exposed to systematic philosophy or really think about this word much, this is a little bit difficult to get at. But system just means all-encompassing. Like it touches, like it explains everything. Hegel's offering a theory of everything, how everything works, how everything comes to be or changes, why everything is the way it is, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So like all the major philosophical questions and, and their various sort of subsidiary questions, Hegel's trying to answer them all in a way that is self-consistent. He's trying to give you an entirely new system of thought. Again, it's hard to wrap your head around. If you're not used to thinking about this, you're sort of used to thinking about like one question at a time and not comparing it for coherence among others. Um, bear with me. He's trying to give a full account of the underlying structure of all of reality, you know, you know, whatever the hell that means, or what, right? Um, interestingly, you might say well, that's really audacious. Yeah, it's audacious. A lot, a lot of Hegel's thought has the flavor of the following flavor. Like you could, you could preface a lot of the statements with, "Everyone before me thought this, but that's wrong. Here's why." Right? So, like, um, interestingly, the one thing that he leaves out, the one thing that he never really gives a full account of, is his immense intellectual modesty. Okay. Anyways, um, we're going to talk about this under sort of three headings here. Okay. The first being the general gist of his thought. The second being a particular example that will do two things, illuminate that general gist and help us understand his attraction or sorry, his attractiveness to the Marxists or the critical theorists or the radicalists, whatever you want to call them. And then three well, we could break this up into three and four, but I'm going to put on just one. Three is the style and the vocabulary. What he says and how he says it, okay? 
And, and there's a really particular reason that we're going to talk about that, but you'll see in a minute, okay? Um, now, Hegel looks at this problem that Kant has arrived at, that everybody's so dissatisfied with now, this we've, what we've here called the Iron Curtain problem, this idea that we can know what we expect. Hang on. This idea that we can know appearances, but not you know the ultimate reality behind things. And thus, you might argue, we can't know anything at all, really. Right? He looks at this and he goes, "Well, look, this is where you'd have to. This is where you'd have to arrive at. This is not like a surprise. This is a logical outworking of an assumption that here it is. Everyone before me has been making." And I'm going to fix it. Dude, I got this, right? He says the problem that everybody, the assumption that, the problematic assumption that everybody's been making is this. From time immemorial, ever since we learned to ask this question, can we know anything? What is, you know, what is the, what is the human subjects, the human mind's relation to the object of knowledge, right? Everyone has just assumed that at bottom, the mind is a separate thing from that which it perceives. That's the problem. Talk to you guys later. <laughs> you might say, no, what? What? Listen to this. Hegel's like, yeah, I mean, because this seems, right. you l- look across the room, okay? Do you see the light or the lamp or the wall or the chalkboard or the book or the couch or the bottle of beer or the, whatever you're looking at? Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, you've always supposed that in perceiving something, you are a different thing from that which you're perceiving, In other words, the appearance reality problem is a problem of a mind and a world that is a separate thing from it. And as long as you suppose this or assume this, says Hegel, you're going to arrive at Kant's problem. Because what you're implicitly doing is you're supposing that there is no unity that binds these two things. In other words, there's no relation between them. But if there's no relation between them, then you could never be sure they correspond. And not being sure that they correspond is exactly Kant's problem, just put in different words. But, says Hegel, they are related. Or, if there's going to be knowledge, and it seems like there is, we would have to suppose they are related. So let's work that way. And you're like, wait, what? Related? Hegel thinks that there's a deeper relation, a deeper unity, that these two things, the subject and the object, are not two separate things, but are part of one larger thing. And that thing is like, here here it gets weird. I mean, it's, it gets weird. It's like a mind. It's like, a, it's like mental. The world, uh, <laughs> reality itself is like one big mind. Okay, so the distinction between subject and object is not the ultimate distinction. There's a deeper unity below everything. It's all one thing, not two things. All right. Why why is this important? Where is this going? All right, listen. What does this allow? (laughs) Let me break off for a second. Uh. If you have to think for a moment, just for the time being until this gets a little bit clear, if you have to think of this thing being like God, I guess that's okay. But as we're going to see in a minute, it's really not God, okay? Or at least not as the, you know, like the Judeo-Christian tradition in the the scriptures have suggested God is. What, What you find there is that God is an independent, complete thing, God does not rely on anything else for his knowledge, for his existence, for his any of his attributes, for his reality, for anything. It's not like God is like bound up with something else, right? And like has like a dependent relation on it, okay? That's very much unlike what Hegel's supposing here. But when a lot of people, a lot of times when people first hear this idea about Hegel, they're like, oh, he means like God. The world is like God. We're all part of this larger thing. It's like God. Well, maybe... For him, maybe Hegel's God, but that's not that's not the Judeo-Christian God. Okay, the Judeo-Christian God was like there, like the Bible says, in the beginning, before everything, right? And was fine, was doing good, was okay, did not need anything. Okay, and then went, you know what? Let's make the world. Let's make man. Let's do it, right? Okay, that's not this. 
Um, there's a passage in Dostoevsky's book, The Possessed. Sometimes the title of that book is translated Demons. Uh, either way, there's a passage in that book where the main character is confronted by some others and is confronted because they think he's an atheist. And he goes, and he's actually a Hegelian, right? As, as you'll find out. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God. Uh, mais distinguons. Let, this friend, he's always speaking French. He says, but let us draw a distinction. I believe in God as a being who is conscious of himself only in me or in me only. So my self-consciousness is the only conduit God has for his self-consciousness. Now, some of you, the sharper ones, <laughs> are the ones that just like to really understand what's... Some of you might be saying, well, that's just to say you're God. Yes, stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. Um, but but the character, uh, uh, Stepan Verkovinsky, in this book is essentially expressing this Hegelian idea that the world, or God, is this larger unity that binds everything. But as far as consciousness or self-awareness goes, I am God's self-consciousness. He's not an independent. He needs me to know himself. He's not an independent thing, Right? That's very different than the Judeo-Christian idea. And, and I'm not just mentioning it here sort of haphazardly. This actually has a very, very pertinent consequence. Okay? Here's why. Hang on, i got to pause this for a second. Or maybe the best way to get at why is to just again remind ourselves, again rehearse what problem Hegel was trying to solve. After all, if, you know... <laughs> Knowledge. I mean, knowledge is the problem Hegel's trying to solve. If the world is this one, if, you know, we're going to go against Kant and we're going to say, no, 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 there's a deeper unity and the unity is mental and the world is this one big interrelated systematic y mindy thing that includes, right? If it's all this one smooth synthetic system of stuff, mind, whatever, you know, what Hegel calls absolute spirit, as we'll see later, well, then, uh, Whence comes all the issues? Whence comes all the contradictions? Whence comes all the tensions? Whence comes all the conflict? Whence comes, uh, Hegel, whence comes all the things that drove us to explore this problem and hash out what knowledge was in the first place? Just saying that it's one big mind doesn't solve the problem. And Hegel says, yes, it does. There's another assumption deeper down related to this first assumption that I've now abolished that will answer you. Hegel says, hand in hand with that first assumption it is an assumption that everyone before me has made and that assumption is wrong too. That assumption is this, that knowledge and justification and explanation and you know all these sort of interrelated you know knowledgey epistemological concepts that we throw around he says everyone is always supposed that the way knowledge is justified is kind of what we well what we talked about in the first series of this podcast from darwin to donald trump when we talked about going a level down then going a level down then going a level down the idea that knowledge is like a structure and the upper floors are supported by the lower floors Right, and the lower floors are supported su supported by the foundation. This view is called foundationalism, and that eventually you get to this bottom floor that you know has the ultimate justification to it, and then that justification flows upwards through the structure like load bearing walls and supports the rest of the thing. Right, so if you want to know why something's true at the top, you got to ask you know what makes it true a level below. And knowledge is a structure like that. So if I say that the chair is red, well, that's a claim, but that's at a real high level because it depends on assumptions, other claims, other knowledge claims about my my visual capacities, the lighting in the room, you know, my my tendency to lie. My okay, see, so. Knowledge claims are built on top of other knowledge claims. And if we, at any point, if we want to say, I mean, we sort of went through this in the, from Darwin to Donald Trump series, didn't we? At any point, if we want to ask a question about the justification of a claim at one level, we're going to have to go down a level and down and down and down till we come to some sort of fact, some sort of claim that doesn't need that kind of justification. It just sort of, well, sort of speaks for itself. And the philosophical name for this is something that's self-evident. Okay, It doesn't rely on another truth to legitimate it, to validate it. Now, Hegel says, no, 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 justification is not like that. 
so we don't have to worry about all these different contradictions. Contradictions, says Hegel, are actually, no, you know what we're talking about when we say contradictions, we're talking about all the clashes, the varying clashes of claims of truth, whether it be something as menial as the color of the chair in the room or something as consequential as marriage is defined by a relationship between the two distinct genders. <laughs> okay? This touches everything. Hegel says, no, 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 don't worry about the contradictions because that view, that knowledge structure foundationalism view is actually not how truth works. <gasps> Uh-oh. He says, we can't look back. Uh-oh. Now, I, I mean back here in two senses. The obvious sort of metaphysical, time, temporal sense, back in, gotta go back in time, right? But I also mean it, mean it in like a, a logical sense. We don't look back. We don't look, to put it in terms of our structure, we don't look beneath. We don't go down. Justification doesn't come from the bottom, from the back, from the before, from the foundations. It comes from, well, it comes from the future. From the future, we, we progress towards it. It's a process. It is developmental in nature. Justification is, which means truth is, which means rationality is. Listen, that means that we don't got to worry about these contradictions in, in so many words. They'll iron themselves out. And actually, if we look back at history, says Hegel, that's what the process of history is, is these things ironing themselves out. Justification for our beliefs, says, says Hegel, is not found in the basement. It's not found at the bottom. It doesn't flow from the bottom. It comes at the end. We'll know it, it, it. We don't have it yet. So these problems, these things that seem like contradictions, they're not impasses. They're bridges. If we would only see them as such. Remember... Remember a while back when we were talking about Marcuse, we talked about like the contradictions, how conservatives are always flummoxed by liberals because they don't understand how they cannot see the contradictions in their view. Like, how can you not understand that when you're talking about tolerance, you're actually being totally intolerant in the way you describe the features of tolerance and how it should be implemented and so on and so forth, right? How can they not see this? Well, the truth of the matter is that they're at heart Hegelians. And they don't they are not phased by this because they have a different view, whether they know it or not. I don't think they're self, most of them are self-conscious about it, but they have a different view of justification. It comes at the end. We'll know it when we get there. Don't worry about the contradictions. I mean, think about how they talk about the U.S. Constitution, right? It's living and breathing. It means whatever you want. You know, well, well it, it means different things at different times, and we can't say what it needs to mean until we get there, right? Um, this is political progressivism, and it comes from Hegel, Okay. This is really important. So what seems like a tension, what seems like an inconsistency, what seems like a contradiction at one point in time, at one point in thought, at one point in history, in one context, right? As things develop, as things progress, it gets ironed out. And we see that there's some like new, higher, deeper truth that explains what formerly seemed like a contradiction between two seemingly true propositions. The short of it is that for Hegel, the key way to defang or defuse th this problem that Kant has given us, you know, on the heels of the problem that all the guys before him gave us, is to see that knowledge and justification are all these things are, are not like all these guys have supposed. They're, they're in progress. They're a process. They're developmental in nature. Okay? They're developmental. So don't worry about the contradictions. We'll, we'll know the truth when we get there. It's an unfolding thing. Remember we said Hegel's going to explain everything. Hegel sees all of reality as this unfolding truth of which we have, you know, like progressively better and better understanding as time moves on. And the motor of that development is the conflict or seeming conflict between seemingly contradictory truths. Um, a moment ago I said that distinguishing Hegel's God from the Judeo-Christian God would sort of help us see this. What did I mean by that? Well, think about it this way. If there's a God, or maybe I should say it more accurately, if there is God who is a complete, independent, self-reliant, utterly in need of nothing else being back of the world, behind the world, or you might say before the world, you know, however you want to catch out, cash out that priority. If there's that, or maybe I should say more accurately, if there's him, right? If there's that, 
if that God exists, well, then there would be a place. This is a little bit hard to get at, but bear with me. There would be sort of a metaphysical space for these complete truths to live, namely in the mind of God, right? But if there's not that, then what are we doing going back and down and back and down, you know, logically or metaphysically to try to get at the foundational truth? We would ha- we we have to view truth as a developmental process laden progressive thing. Because if we're going like back and down like imagine like a like a Cartesian coordinate system, you know, up and to the right is positive and back and to the left is negative, right? If we're going back and down and back and down, down through the structure of knowledge, right? Well there there's nowhere for ultimate truth to, to live, right? So ultimate truth has to be forward. Uh oh. Democrat national campaign slogan, forward. Hey, I'm just saying, <laughs> I can't spell it all, all here. I'm inad- inadequate to the task, but I'm just saying. It has to be forward, okay? So so we said we were going to talk about this under like three headings, and the first heading was the general gist of Hegel's thought, and the crucial takeaway here is that Hegel solves these big problems that come to him from those that have come before him by changing this view of what justification is and how it's arrived at and by unifying and he did that because he had to unify the subject and the object of knowledge and suppose that they were one you know part of one larger unified thing and again if they're part of larger unified thing then where are all the contradictions coming from well the contradictions are coming from the incompleteness of that thing it's developmental so they'll iron themselves out okay Is that clear so far? I I can't say a lot more about this, but I did say I want to give a particular example of it, and I said I want to do that for two reasons. The first is because it will just sort of give us an example of what we were just talking about, and the second is because this, this particular, particular example will help us understand Hegel's relation to the Marxists. So, we said that Hegel is giving us, he's ambitious to the nth. He's giving us a theory of everything, okay? And uh, <laughs> and if you're going to give a theory of everything and well then one of the things you're going to need to give a theory of or explain is uh, human self-consciousness or, or just the existence of the human mind like the human self-consciousness right especially if you're especially if the upshot of your theory is that the world or the totality of reality itself is itself a, a sort of semi quasi conscious mind like thing right what about all these little bits of that floating around in that in that bigger thing what are they and how did they how did they come to be hegel hegel's got to explain this and explaining the origin of self consciousness he gives this little anecdote this little uh, this little illustration called the master slave dialectic okay we'll talk a little bit more about what the word dialectic means in a minute but perhaps immediately in this name, the master-slave dialectic, you can see the germs of what is going to make the Marxists salivate because <laughs> they love to talk about slavery and everything is slavery and the world is slavery and every human relation is slavery. Right? Um, you know, except for real slavery. They're fine with that. Um, everything else they're, they're not okay with. Now, I'm not going to walk through this whole thought, thought experiment or, or illustration with you. Um, but I just want to point something out about it. And that's this. When he goes to explain about, when he goes to explain how a human self-consciousness comes to be, Hegel ends up saying that the process requires the existence of another human self-consciousness. Or maybe that sounds a little bit paradoxical, like if we're explaining how there could be self-consciousness, then how could we appeal to another self-consciousness in order to do so? Maybe the best way to say it is one potential human self-consciousness requires the presence of another potential human self-consciousness in order to develop into a human self-consciousness. Nick, what does this even mean? Why are you talking about it? What does this have to do with Marxism? Listen again. Hegel is giving a theory of what it means to be a person. That means effectually that he's giving a theory of how a person comes to have all the things that we may wish to attribute to a person. 
we've been talking a lot about rights and values and things like this, right? Hegel is giving a theory about what it means to be a person. And what he says is that personhood, the individual personhood, is logically, metaphysically secondary to collective personhood. You might say, I didn't hear him say that. Think about what we just said. Human self-consciousness, in order to come to be, requires this process, this interaction with another, sorry, potential human self-consciousness. In other words, we've been talking about the one and the many, remember, in past episodes and past series. The one is derivative of the many. Do you see? The one is secondary to to the many. You don't get the one till you have the two, the many. You don't get the individual till you have the group. The group is logically, metaphysically, in every way, prior. Uh Uh-oh. Because the individual means nothing. It just means nothing. You see? This is collectivism. The fundamental unit of meaning, the fundamental unit is the group. It's not the person. The person only gets what it has through an interaction with the group. The individual means nothing. Political progressivism. Collectivism. Leftism. See? Now, the Marxists love this stuff. They love it. Okay? And they love it for two reasons. The second of which we're going we're gonna to come to in a second, which is going to explain, I think, the whole purpose of this section. The first reason they love it might be fairly obvious. It's this. Again, Hegel is giving a theory of everything. How everything came to be. Why everything is the way it is. The rational structure of reality itself. And what he ends up saying is that it's developmental or progressive in nature. Well, what fuels that progression? What fuels that development? What is the motive force or power of metaphysical change in Hegel's world as he's describing it. Guess what? It's conflict. I mean, however you want to cash it out, it could be conflict between seeming truths. It could be conflicts among cultures. It could be, depending on what we're talking about, history or logic or whatever, right? Conflict. Okay? Remember Marx? Do you remember Marx? All of human social history is the history of oppression conflict okay hegel is saying human personality itself is founded in this dialectical you know gets its gets its substance is founded in this dialectical process that is fueled by conflict and you don't get individual personhood without first group potential personhood the one is dependent on the many. The Marxists love this. And they foist this little illustration over every human relationship you can think of, just like Marx. All of human social history, says Marx. See? All right? Master and slave as a relationship between two, two roles is just, the, is just the example that Hegel uses to show this process. Uh, in process to show how this this development develops okay he calls it the master slave dialectic you know actually i should say just a little bit more about what in substance the master slave dialectic is because that sheds a little bit of light on why they love this too i mean i've only said that the key thing about the master slave dialectic is well that it is for hegel the origin story of human self-consciousness and we've pointed out here that what's important about it is that individual self-consciousness and therefore individual meaning it everything related to the individual is secondary to that of the group you have to, you have to have you have to have plurality before you have unity you have to have uh, plurality before you have individuality so the individual means nothing the individual secondary okay in in his particular thought experiment in the master slave dialectic what he's describing is the conflict the dialectical conflict of two seeming opposites that, here comes the key word, develops into a higher truth that is a synthesis between these two seeming opposites. So you have the master and you have the slave, 
And it seems that the, the relationship is very clear. The master is the master, the slave is the slave, but then in mastering the slave, the master comes to be dependent upon the slave and is therefore, in, in a way, enslaved to the slave because of that dependency that, you know, if you're doing everything for me, I'm dependent on you. Well, and then in a sense, I'm, I'm your slave, right? I, I'm dependent on you. So Hegel uses his master-slave dialectic to describe this, the, the, the dialectical way in which a conflict between two seeming opposites develops into, see that? develops into a higher truth. The master starts out by being the master, and the slave starts out by being the slave, and they seem like opposites, right? There seems like a complete contradiction between the two, but then this process happens, and the contradiction is resolved into a higher truth that you don't know till after the fact. We know it when we'll get there. Contradictions don't matter. They get ironed out by the process by the dialectic. Now, the other reason they love this, which is equally important, is coming to now the third heading under which we said we were going to talk about Hegel. The third thing I said I wanted to say about him. The first was the general gist of his thought, the developmentalism. The second was this master-slave dialectic that sort of illustrates that human personality is a product of, 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 of the group of multiple personalities. It's, it's not individualistic. It's not independent. Okay, there's a dependence there. Um, and we said the collectivists love this because in their mind, this vindicates collectivism. You remember our previous president? You know, the guy before Trump, the guy with all those names. Remember when he said that thing about individual business owners? Remember he said, you didn't build that. What did he mean? Well, you relied on the group. There was more at work than just your individual efforts. The individual means nothing. Okay, that's it. But there's a third thing. Uh, there's a third item to our agenda here, and that third thing is the second reason that they love him, and this will bring the whole matter home for this section, and I'm going to say it this way. Actually, I'm going to let somebody else say it. Hegel wrote some very long and very famous books, among them The Phenomenology of Spirit, The Science of Logic, and Elements of the Philosophy of Right. But, we'll be frank, he wrote horribly. His work is confusing and complicated when it should be clear and direct. He tapped into a weakness of human nature to be trustful of grave-sounding, incomprehensible prose. Grave-sounding, incomprehensible prose. Remember the emperor's new clothes? Do you see what's going on here? Hegel sort of founded or fathered or kicked off this way of writing and communicating that was so convoluted that it sounded high-minded. Remember the subjects of the kingdom in the emperor's new clothes, the way they would have to describe the emperor's clothing in elaborate detail. They have to, they have to trick out the lie in elaborate detail. Here, the language, the grave sounding, incomprehensible prose is doing the same thing. It's performing the same function. Hegel talked and wrote in this convoluted way that made what he was saying sound incredibly complex. And therefore, here comes the human weakness, true. Do you see? Meaninglessness masked in grave-sounding, incomprehensible prose. Now, it's, ju now, it's not just the style. Okay, there's two things I want to say about Hegel's language here. It's not just the style like the gentleman just, just told us about. It's also the words themselves. Hegel coined all these words, all this terminology, all this vocabulary that has been carried on after him and applied throughout critical theory and postmodernism and used and regurgitated over and over again in imitation of Hegel for the same purposes. What are those purposes? Again, it's to mask the meaninglessness, all right? This is what that guy meant by grave-sounding language. It's grave. It sounds just deep and profound and serious and significant and intellectual and complicated, and but it's not. The emperor's naked, all right? And there's just all these words. There's all these, all, all these pieces of terminology that Hegel brings in to sort of like explain, you know, all his concepts that were so unique. And uh, I, I was going to run through a list of these. I mean, there's just so many. And some of them come straight from Hegel, and then others are sort of like summations of Hegelian ideas that, you know, get their footing after Hegel by his followers, and then they get sort of built into the literature. And then by the time we get down to this day, you, you know, it's, 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 it's almost become such a part of, well, here's one of them. It's become such a part of popular culture that there's, there's words that you've heard 
or I should say use usages of certain words that you've heard that you don't even realize come from him. So has anybody ever said to you, uh, something like this, has anybody said to you, you're scared of the other, or don't be scared of the other, or stop seeing them as the other, the other, the other, not that other, the other, other, you know what I mean? Anybody ever said that to you? That's from Hegel. Okay. The other was the other potential human self-consciousness in the, uh, the master slave dialectic. The one that requires the presence of the other one in order to realize its own self-consciousness. And hence, we're off to the races with collectivism because a person isn't a person until there's more people. All right. Anyways, I was going to go through this whole list. Um, That all these guys following Hegel, all these postmodernists, all these critical theorists, all these Marxists just bite from Hegel. They just reuse all these terms over and over and over. And I hope it's somewhat clear now why they do so. Um... Again, the Marxist position is a position that has to make pretense of looking scientific, of looking like it's based in the the, the, the material world around us, like based in the facts, you know? It has to make pretense of looking like that, okay? Like it's based in observation of the actual world. But despite needing to look like this, it cannot actually subject itself to any meaningful potential observation that would disprove it or call it into question so it needs to reimagine logic itself in a way such that such criticisms don't have any bite and this is just what hegelianism does contradictions used to mean you know that we had gone wrong somewhere in our reasoning now in the hands of a hegelian they're just like a sign that there's some higher truth that we haven't completely grasped yet but we're working on it we'll know it when we get there and the academic marxists where's my mouse the academic marxists love this stuff they love it i still can't find my mouse i got too many screens here they love it and they make heavy use of hegel's terminology in addition to copying his convoluted style that we just discussed and the convoluted style too in addition to the terminology is just another device designed to produce designed to protect designed to protect the Marxism at the core of the thing from any substantial criticism. So I was going to devote a bunch of time here to running through the list of words. But we've already sort of seen a little bit of it, like we said, just with the master-slave dialectic. The other is a famous one. Well, dialectic itself, that word itself is like the the, the main one. Uh, but there's tons of other ones, and it's so tempting to run through them here. Again, some straight from Hegel's mouth and then others that have sort of like popped up since Hegel as ways of sort of like summarizing or like implementing Hegelian ideas or, you know, combining ideas. Anyways, like, so some of them have come up when we talked about the different different varieties of critical theories. Structure, uh, dialectic, of course, is one of them. Primitive, negation, discipline, logic, something blank logic. So any kind of logic, like Western logic, American logic, capitalist logic. Okay. Um. So dialectic, again, obviously being the main one, but there's others. Structure, primitive, negation, discipline, Western logic, colonizer, absolute spirit, moment, absolute moment, the other, power, hegemony. So, okay, all these words. I got to just give you a sample of what this stuff sounds like when you read it, because it's really just unimaginable until you hear this kind of writing, okay? Um... So let's, let, let's just forego the like exhaustive list of terms. You'll hear them. <laughs> You'll hear them in this. Okay. Um, again, and this, well, the one we just discussed, words like the other have seeped into the popular parlance. You know, these are like, you can open in, well, not that anybody opens a newspaper anymore, but you can read a public, a, a modern, you know, contemporary casual publication, a, a, a news site, or you can come across terms like this that take this stuff seriously. The authors that are writing using Hegelian ideas that don't even realize they're doing it. But instead of dwelling on the list, I just want to come back to this main thing, this main concept. It's so important. The dialectic. It's like the core, fundamental, bedrock, baseline, central, all-important, foundational concept that Hegel introduces. Um, And I just want to make sure, because we're just about done here, I just want to make sure you understand why it's so important. Why this concept is employed, deployed, used, reused, repurposed, 
you know, everywhere you look, um, and why it resurfaces everywhere you look. What, what is it? Why are they so obsessed with this idea, the dialectic? Because what they see in it is this ultimate get out of jail free card. And, you know, of course, most of them do believe in radicalist prison reform, so not, ju- not just figuratively. Uh, why is it the ultimate get out of jail free card? Because he who is in possession of it, the dialectic, I mean, is thereby, apparently, relieved of the responsibility of making any sense. Why? Because contradictions don't matter. Contradictions just represent two seemingly opposing truths for which we've not yet realized or encountered the, the synthesis, which makes them, make, makes them both make sense. The higher truth. You know, the emergence of that higher truth is the promise of the dialectic. All right? The dialectic is everything to these folks because the dialectic licenses everything. Let me illustrate this with a little anecdote as we close. Actually, two. And they're both about Marx. I think I told you earlier I was going to drop two bombs. Well, here they are. Actually, before I do, let me just let me just offer an anecdote of my own here. Um, you know the point at which all this started to hit me? Hey, just hang on to the Marx thing for a second. Uh, I read this review of a book that could be called A Book of Critical Theory. It came out, uh, I think, right around the time of the Iraq War. And this was a little bit after that. I was an undergrad a little bit after that. And I, I came across, I was in a class where we were actually legit, like for real. I had this postmodern critical theorist teacher. I, uh, I was in a class where we were reading a lot of this stuff. And I just happened upon this review of a book of this ilk, of this genre. And I started reading it. And what just jumped out at me about this review was just how just how casually and comfortably the author was just like just brushed it aside just brushed the material aside i don't mean without without criticizing it. i don't mean without taking it seriously i meant literally looked at it read it rehearsed it and then just simply pointed out this is meaningless this doesn't mean anything <laughs> and it was just so simple of an observation that it just kind of smacked me upside the head like oh yeah oh yeah the emperor is naked you know and it, it really it really hit me um, a couple other things were happening at the time. It, look, he, he just, I should read you a couple, a couple excerpts from this. Let me read you a passage from this book that I'm talking about, <laughs> or the book that, the book that the review is of. You're probably like, Nick, I thought we were getting done. We're getting done. Just listen to this. I really, you got to hear this. You got to hear this. Here's a passage from this book is called Empire. And you know how earlier I said, um, all these things are just variations on Marxism. Well, Empire is just a new book that's like the, 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 the 21st century communist manifesto. So it's like all these concepts are switched out. So now it's instead of like Marx talked about capital, well, now, this, now the main vehicle of the oppression is empire. And, right, so they just transpose all the concepts, but it's all Marxism. All right. And uh, well, here, listen to this. Are you ready? Here's a passage. He says, Kimball, the guy who wrote the review, writes this. He writes, uh, Empire is full of passages like this one on the dialectic of colonialism. Here it is, quote, In the logic of colonialist representations, the construction of a separate, colonized other, and the segregation of identity and alterity turns out, paradoxically, to be at once absolute and extremely intimate. The process consists, in fact, of two moments that are dialectically related. In the first moment, difference has to be pushed to the extreme. In the colonial imagination, the colonized is not simply an other banished outside the realm of civilization. Rather, it is grasped or produced as other, as the absolute negation, as the most distant point on the horizon. End quote. All right. Now, if you're a person who is just animated by a desire to be thought of as profound and deep and intelligent and penetrating by other people, well, A, you have some insecurity problems, B, you're probably not that profound and intelligent, and C, you'll probably love this stuff. Because I saw, and I tempted <laughs> temptations there for me too, well, in different forms, I mean, not this material, I saw a lot of students hear this stuff and go, well, that sounds intellectual, and just, and just bite it hook line and sinker okay and just start and just and just go on board with the professor immediately and never go off, never get off you know and 
it's meaningless. Let me re- let's just read one more passage. I want to give you an example of the of the of the childlike criticism. I said a moment ago that, that the author who wrote this review asked these very simple, penetrating questions about the text, and I want to give you an example of that because in the in the Emperor's New Clothes story, it's a child who who makes the simple observation. And don't get it twisted. I mean, it's not like it's easy to do this. It's not like it's easy to say no. That's meaningless. It's not like it's easy to stand against the tide. It's not like it's easy to step on the other side of the line from which everyone else is standing on the other side and say, no, you got the, you, this is just nonsense. This is all nonsense. Because it, because it makes you alone. And then it makes you a target of ridicule. And it, right? In fact, we're going to do, do a show about that after this series is over, explaining the name of this podcast. But for the moment, listen to this. Uh, the author says, um, these two authors who wrote the book Empire... Um, Never, let me just read the passage. Okay, so, here, so here's the second passage I want to read from this book, Empire. Listen to this. And then I'm going to read you what Kimball has to say about it because I just want you to see how simple the criticism is. Okay? Oftentimes, truth is not that complicated. Oftentimes, you have to see it like a child with discernment, but nonetheless like a child. In fact, sometimes children are the only ones with, <laughs> with certain kinds of discernment. Okay, listen to this. Listen to this passage. I mean, listen to this. Quote, In the passage from disciplinary society to society of control, a new paradigm of power is realized which is defined by the technologies that recognize society as the realm of biopower. In disciplinary society, the effects of biopolitical technologies were still partial in the sense that disciplining developed according to closed geometrical and quantitative logics. Disciplinarity fixed individuals within institutions but did not succeed in consuming them completely in the rhythm of productive practices and productive social socialization. It did not reach the point of permeating entire the consciousness and bodies of individuals. End quote. Now, <laughs> Kimball hears this and he asks a very simple question, or two or three. Listen. He says about that passage, he says, contemporary academics simply adore this sort of thing. Promiscuous talk about, quote, power and, quote, discipline seem to provide them with an almost erotic frisson. The charge is especially great when the talk is translated into academies. After all, never say discipline when you can say disciplinarity. <laughs> and, and when dark, irresistible forces, unrecognized by the rest of us, are postulated. I mean, after all, who knows what, quote, permeating entirely the consciousness and bodies of individuals in the above passage even means. Just think about it. We are supposed to inhabit, us, the readers, that, quote, society of control that Hart and Negri, the authors, describe or warn about. They never describe anything without an air of admonition. And then he asks, in what sense, listen to this, in what sense does power or discipline or disciplinarity or whatever permeate, quote, entirely the consciousness of bodies of individuals? For example... You and me. In no sense. <laughs> I, hope that, I hope that was your answer. In no sense. What, he asked for that matter, are, quote, closed and geometrical quantitative logics. Who knows? <laughs> yes. But the aura, listen to this closing, listen. But the aura of bad news is unmistakable. See, it's the aura that matters. The aura of bad news is unmistakable. And for intellectuals bent on promulgating anguish, Bad news is glad tidings. Grave sounding, incomprehensible prose. Hegel laid hold of a human weakness. The weakness of thinking that because something is thick and dense and convoluted and complicated, that it's therefore intelligent or makes any sense whatsoever. All right meaninglessness so i was in this class in undergrad at the time and when i read that review and man the whole thing is just fire like that it's it's hot <laughs> when, I, when i read that review i had to step back i mean i was already starting to suspect that all this stuff was was a joke right um but i hadn't really gotten far enough in some of the other areas of philosophy to sort of understand what is the problem uh, how this how this comes about and what are the real problems with it. But nonetheless, I already started to realize that some of it was suspect, or a lot of it was suspect. I was in this class where we were reading it. Um, 
And two things happened in this class. <laughs> One was, this was a contemporary philosophy class where we read all this critical theory stuff or its antecedents, you know. Um, and two really memorable things happened. One was that there was this girl who was always very engaged and really wanted to do, to do well and to understand the material. Just a, like I've, I've been a teacher, just a star student, an ideal student, not because she was brilliant, but because she was attentive and asked questions and did the reading. And right, um, she found herself with so many questions, fair questions, straightforward questions about what was being said in the material in this class, that, the stuff that we were reading. So many questions had she that the professor who was the professor of lesbian ethics in our department mind you which i'm not sure what that means you can only be ethical to lesbians or what, is, what does that mean anyway she got so upset with this girl's questions that she kind of well not kind of she lit into her in front of the whole class and you know it's a philosophy class the girl's asking questions about the meaning of the text and she gets screamed at berated belittled in front of the whole class by this professor of lesbian ethics, this cargo pant wearing, combat boot wearing, <laughs> butch <laughs> professor, pseudo academic professor of le lesbian ethics. Um, so, uh, I mean, she was mad. That the professor was mad. She didn't want to be questioned. In in fairness, <laughs> I feel like all I can say here is that when you're trying to demonstrate that all the best basketball players are from Norway, things can get a little tense. So that, that's a thing that happened. By the way, if you don't know what I mean by that, you got to go back to the beginning of this series, okay? <laughs> the other thing that happened was that in this same class, by the time we were supposed to write our final papers, I had really begun to catch on to what was going on, you know, in postmodernism and all this critical theory and stuff. Not by my own lights, I'm an idiot, but just having come across some really good critical literature, and here I mean critical in the real sense, the logical sense, not the Marxist sense. I mean logical criticism. Yeah, Western logic. <laughs> right. Anyway, I decided to write a final paper that was complete nonsense. 10, 11, 12 pages of complete nonsense, only making sure to use all this terminology and write in the general style that I had been imbibing all semester long. All right? I did that. This is not a joke. I did that. I wrote... Th I, I, I want to give myself a little credit here. I, put, put, yourself, put yourself in my position. You got, you know, like, you got like a 3.8 or something. <laughs> you, you're about to turn in like a 10-page paper that's like 30% of your grade for the semester, and so far you've got an A in the class, and you're willing to turn something in. I just, I just now realized that this is kind of... This is kind of meritorious in hindsight i'm like yeah that's kind of bold i just thought it was funny at the time <laughs> but you're willing to turn something in that could very legitimately well not actually not legitimately but by the professor's lights legitimately be given an f and, and and tank your grade for the whole semester but i did it i turned in a paper that was complete nonsense just written with all the vernacular and style and phrasing and right all this stuff that we've been talking about grave sounding incomprehensible prose and you know what i got on that paper you ready I got an A, and I got an A in the class. I could, I, if, if, if you press me for it, I could go to my shoebox in my closet right now and pull it out and show you. No, I'm not going to do that, but I could. I got it right here. It's got an A. It's got, the, got her comments on it. Her comments are nonsense too. <laughs> but it's true. Both those things happened. All right. Um, and I offer that last one in lieu of uh, something I was going to do here at the game, which was to play, or something I was going to do here at the end, which was play a game with you and the game was going to be this i was going to read you a passage from a book written by a postmodernist critical theorist author and then i was going to read you another passage from another presumable presume you know putative book that was written by a computer algorithm to imitate that style of writing and i was going to ask you to choose which one was real which one was written by a person which one was written by a computer and you know what you would not be able to do it they are equally nonsensical and they are equally devoid of anything resembling human meaning or meaning for humans or however you want to catch that out, right? Or, or sense or logic or cohesion or coherence or any, any of it, all right? Uh, but I'm not going to do that because you get the idea now. I got an A on the paper, all right? Uh, but I do want to offer you these two, two bombs that I said I was going to drop before we get out of here. So here's the first. Well, they're both, they're both anecdotes and they're both about Marx. Here's the first. You ready? 
Marx was writing a letter to a friend. And they were, I guess, in the course of the interaction, the correspondence, they were discussing um, an upcoming election. Again, forgive me if I'm getting the, the details not entirely right here, but this is, this is paraphrasing. This is true as it needs to be. And Marx is, discuss, is, say, is talking about a prediction that he's made about the election, and, he's, and, and, he, and he expresses the awareness of the possibility, he says, that he shall make an ass of himself. In other words, he'll end up like squarely wrong and just, you know, like all the folks who are like, Trump doesn't have a chance. You know, now they look like idiots, right? Though <laughs> he's like, that's exactly what he sees. He's like, think of him as like a Stephen Colbert or like a, you know, like a, what, what, who, what, who's that English dude? Um, John Oliver, right? He's like, it's possible I'll make an ass of himself, myself. You know, I'll be wrong. He goes, but listen to what he says. He says, but in that case, I shall merely resort to a little fill in the blank. I shall merely resort to a little dialectic. And then he says, and you're like, what? And he says, and he explains, he says, I have so worded my proposition as to be right either way. Meaninglessness. This is, do you see? If, if both a statement and its opposing statement are both true, then nothing's either true or false, right? I mean, it's like, all, all bets are off. Meaninglessness. Okay? What Marx is saying is that the supposed problem that he might face in being wrong about the prediction that, you know, you might say he and his friend know he's making between them, he says it's no problem at all because he plans to say something publicly that is meaningless. Or you could say he is, he is saying that he has said something publicly that is meaningless. Why is it meaningless? Right? Well, he says he can impose some meaning on it after the fact any which way. Why can he do that? Well, because what he's, what he's said or what he's written or whatever has a pliability about it. Well, how does it have a pliability about it? It has a pliability from the obscure language, obscure vocabulary, obscure vernacular. And it's overall just like affected style that it's written in. So Marx didn't have to worry about being proved wrong by his own prediction because he had so worded his proposition as to be right either way by just employing a little bit of the dialectic. The dialectic as given to him by Hegel, whom we've said he was a huge fan of and grew up reading, and ingesting, and imbibing, and believing, and modeling his, modeling his worldview and his theories, his political system, after the works and thought of Hegel. You know, he was so infatuated with Hegel. Here's a second anecdote now, and then we're done. Are you ready? Well, we're not done. Next episode, we're done, but we're done here. He was so infatuated with Hegel that he wrote a poem about him when he was a young man. May I read you one line from the poem? Just one line. It's not going to be like the beginning of this series when I did a, a whole poem. <laughs> Just one line. You ready? It's a poem about Hegel. And in this, Marx says, words, have I said this already? Stop me, if you've, stop me if you've heard this one. I don't think I have. Words I teach all mixed up in a devilish muddle so that anyone may think exactly what they like. End quote. Words I teach, all mixed up in a devilish muddle, so that anybody may think exactly what he pleases. That's a poem from Marx about Hegel. So in addition to being Hegel's biggest fanboy, Marx apparently thought there was something distinctly devilish about Hegel and about the meaninglessness with which Hegel operated in his writings, and of course, as the subsequent followers have as well. Something devilish about it. Is he being literal? Is he being figurative? What does he mean? What does he mean, devilish muddle? The chaos and confusion you see in the streets is preceded by and is caused by a chaos and confusion in the mind, as engendered by all of this meaningless drivel coming from academia.
All right. Now let me ask you a question. Who has a vested, vested, and I mean vested, interest in chaos and confusion? Anyway, think about that and then come back and join us for the last installment, part 15 of Unmasking Antifa. My name is Nick. This is the 40 Ounce Hemlock Podcast. And thank you, thank you, thank you for sticking this one out. I know it was long. We'll see you there. Such awesome